Okay, ladies and gents, I'm here. I'm sorry we're running late. I may or may not, but totally did, uh, spill my, uh, my zero calorie soda everywhere. So, so, uh, like I sat down, I was like, okay, let's do it. This is going to be a good day. And then I reached to like hit the mute button so that I can then start the stream and get the music going. I reach for it and just immediately knock the can over and it spills everywhere. So I have a bit of a mess on my hands, but you know what? We'll deal with it later. That's a future Luke problem, right? Let's live like millennials. Not think about it right now. <laughs> It'll be fine. Just don't worry about it. Um, projector full screen so yeah I'm, a, I'm kind of scrambling but i'm glad to have you guys here i am happy to see you yeah the hair is a little crazy today it's pretty shaggy uh you see this bit i don't know what that is but you know what it's like my little poof my little frill what are you gonna do you're missing the avocado toast fail too dude i've never got i'm gonna be real i've never understood avocado toast i don't get the appeal like, I don't, I think oh, avocados are also overrated. The only way you can make them edible is by, like, blending them and then putting lime and cilantro and all sorts of stuff in it. By that point, it's like, okay, just, like, go eat a salad, you know? It's kind of where I'm at. Um, yeah, Jacob with the, the doc. I'm cutting Jacob a little slack because we are scrambling to get this God of War video done we have a very tight schedule by the way i hate to be this guy once again there we go um hot take yeah avocado is overrated but um i hate to be this guy again we will be doing a slightly shorter stream today like an actually shorter stream because literally i am not kidding hold on i will check the actual number literally 13 minutes before we started streaming, um, so like at 9.45 or so, I got a email with a review code for a game that I've been very interested in and that I've really, really, really wanted to uh, review and play that is coming out very soon. Which game? Let, hold on. Let me see if I can say. Let me see if it says. Um, let's see, I do this. Uh, okay. No, nope, not that. Does do they have localization? Draw distance. I do not actually see a, an embargo time or date. So this is going to be kind of like when in doubt, don't say anything until you know. So I'm not going to say anything until I know. Um, he just gave it away. Yeah. Um, did you see Bill Clinton's kid reaction to his speech? What? Oh, did they get whatever... Um, uh, oh, I don't remember her name. Hillary's daughter. Did they get her to react to it? That's hilarious. If so, that's actually really funny. Did you know your father is like a well-known rabbi <laughs> in the gaming community? What? <laughs> um, I'm a DM the name. Uh, hold on. Let me launch Discord. I, I, again, Windows 11 has been a nightmare. I tried scroll. Like I had a YouTube video pulled up. And on Windows 11, even after reinstalling all graphics drivers, everything, um, after doing all of that, I still, if I scroll while watching a YouTube video, like half the time, it just turns to green. The whole screen. Really, really weird. Um, so if you have any fixes, let me know. Uh, Rocky. Uh, super secret, but the second one. Never had that issue? Yeah, it's really weird. Um, let's see. Hate that kid getting attention rather than from soft. I mean, I, I also find it really cringe. And I just, like, 
I don't know, man. I don't want to encourage it because now every other nobody on Twitch is going to be trying to do that kind of thing to get some quick clout and stuff. And I just don't want to deal with that. Like, it's toxic enough. <laughs> like, come on. Chill out, you know? Chill out. Um, you can go back to Windows 10. Yeah, I think I can. It was like they forced me to update. I didn't want to, but I came downstairs and uh, it had already done it. Are you doing a video on The Witcher 3 next gen? I think you will like what happens in four minutes. <laughs> I think uh, in four minutes, something will go live on the channel that you might just find a little interesting. Uh, did everybody else post their videos already? Yeah. Oh, Dreamcast guy did. People still watch him? Okay. That's surprising. Um, but yeah, in four minutes, I'll, I'll publish the, uh, the video. Oh God, I dropped my fork. So I'm just a mess today. I don't know what the deal is, dude. I'm a mess. Want me to make a doc? Oh, sure, Rocky. You can throw one together real quick with some little tidbits to check out. Um, how do I become a member? It's, I think, uh, on the video, there will be a button that just says join. You just press the join button and then you can sign up that way. We are family. So I'm glad to have you here. Um, Alexander, greetings from Sweden. Show off. I wish I was in Sweden. <laughs> Glad to have you. Thank you for coming by. I, I've always wanted to visit Sweden, actually. All of those countries. Nikki's whole family is from Finland. And you guys, I mean, you've seen Nikki. Nikki looks very Finnish. And so I've always wanted to go there. When Nikki's mom went there to, uh, like a couple of years ago just to visit like her extended family in Finland, she was like, it's it's shocking. It's a country full of Nikki's. Like, it just looks like Nikki everywhere. Everybody looks like it. So... I thought it would be fun to go there. One of the things, though, apparently the Finnish uh, eat really weird fish stuff. Like you'll get go to the uh, her mom was telling me you'll go to a bakery and they'll have like a really nice croissant. And then on top of the croissant is just a sardine or something. I don't know what they're called, but just like a sardine looking fish. It's like, oh, I mean, it looked good, but then you you slapped a fish on it. So. Can I uh, and like if you try to take that off, they get really offended. Like stupid Americans. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, sorry. It just, I don't like it. Doesn't I, I don't want to eat that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to be that guy. Um, you'd never be able to finish that. Eh, eh, yeah, I will. Forsaken demo. Yeah, let's talk about the Forspoken demo. The Forsaken Forspoken demo. Hold on, because I did play it. Let me see if this video actually plays off of this SSD or if I need to copy it over. Let's see. I might need to copy it off of the SSD. It's pretty... It's chugging. This... This... Um, yeah. I played it upstairs on my, my big 110 inch screen or whatever. And so it looked amazing. But... One of the downsides with that is to record it. I have to record it on an Atomos um, Ninja 5. And that thing's great, but it's meant for use like within film productions. So it films at ridiculously high quality. So like this hour and a half long clip or hour long clip is like 500 gigs or something. Like it's ridiculously big. So I always have to transcode it back down to a decent size. Um... Because it's so big that even like my supercomputer is having trouble actually playing it off of that SSD. So I guess I will copy it off of this. Cut, copy. I will copy it off of this and then we will play it from there. Okay, where's a good place to throw it? Cancel office. Okay. Uh, Dropbox game wreck. It's a whole process. You guys don't even know. For spoken is for for spoken is what it is, right? I don't know. It's such a stupid name and it's spelled wrong. Ugh. 
Uh, Brandon, thank you so much. It'll read the, the question in just a second, so I'll let it, I'll let it do that. Um, what are the specs of your supercomputer? You can see in my link tree in the description, you can click on that and go to my kit, and it has all of the information, not just for the computer, but for the camera, the lights, everything. But quick rundown is that it's running a 5950X, a 3080, a... Um, it's got like 64 gigs of RAM. All of the games run off of an M.2 SSD. Um, so, it, like, it's it's pretty kitted out. Do, 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 do. Okay, maybe it's not going to read it. I don't know why it's not reading it. Oh, shoot. I think it's because I still have it muted from the Game Awards. My bad. My bad. Okay, alerts are back on. That's totally what it is. I didn't want the alerts going off and distracting people during the Game Awards, so I muted them so they would just visually appear. But, okay. Um, Let me, let me read it. Uh, Brandon, question for Luke and everyone. PC build and my Steam Deck are coming soon. Being a console player for years, what are the best PC games I got to try out? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, one of the like classics is like Portal. Always go for Portal. Uh, games that you really, really enjoy that you just want to crank, whether that's The Witcher, whether that's Red Dead Two, or um, uh, like Death Stranding, any of those games, you can just jump on, and it'll be like a new game. Um, So, lots of stuff. Half-Life 2, Gary's Mod, Cyberpunk actually is pretty solid on PC. Uh, yeah, lots. Yeah, Rocky, don't you remember? <laughs> don't you remember? You're in the basement. Kanye, look at everyone else. What's your most anticipated game? I know you probably catch flag, but I'm excited for AC Mirage. I'm glad you're excited. I would like to be excited. I just don't know what the game is. I'm actually going to be reaching out to Jor Raptor. And we're going to try to do another collab specifically on AC Mirage. And I like, honestly, I just want to know if he's heard things, if he has like some secret information that I don't, because I've heard nothing about it. And I have people within Ubisoft that talk to me and employees there that talk to me. And like, none of them know what's going on with it. So I don't know who's working on it. I don't know what the deal is. I don't, it's weird. The whole thing is freaking weird. So we're going to try to do uh, another collab probably early January and just figure it out because I, I still, I just don't know. I would love to be excited for it, but I don't know. Jedi Survivor, I'm, I am excited for that. I am also probably most excited for um, Hogwarts Legacy, if I'm being real. Starfield will be interesting. Um... Dead Space Remake will be like, okay. Suicide Squad. I'm more intrigued after the Game Awards thing they showed off. Because that actually looked dark and gritty. One of my my frustrations with what they had shown before is that it didn't look gritty enough. It looked like it wasn't Rocksteady making the game. And this actually looks to be more in line with what we saw in, in Arkham Knight. So I'm very excited for Um, I'm worried Starfield will just be a Skyrim Fallout reskin. I, I'm also a little worried about that. I am still waiting for the thing, you know, like every game has a thing that makes it click and just works with Red Dead 2, you know, it's, it's the, not just amazing graphics, but also just the feeling of exploration. It's a realistic world, it's open, and you can just explore it to your heart's content. Whether it's through hunting, fishing, performing side quests, whatever you want to do. There's so much there to just explore. Um, or, you know, even like Skyrim back in the day, it's the ultimate sandbox. Specifically fantasy sandbox, and it just works. Um, it just works. Uh, especially with... 16 times the detail. You know? 16 times the detail. You see that? 16 times the detail. Available at LukeStevensTV.com. LukeStevensTV.com. One more time. LukeStevensTV.com. Um, there we go. 
so <laughs> product placement. Uh, so like, there's always the one or two things that just work in games that make it click. And I don't know what that's going to be for, for Starfield. I really don't know. Kanye, I, I, one of my marketing professors was like, if you want a customer or somebody to remember anything, you have to repeat it three times. So there you go. You guys are my guinea pigs. How much detail is it? 16 times the detail. Sure is. <laughs> Gumar, thank you for coming by, my friend. Oh, 11 p.m. in India. Yeah, go get some sleep. Have you checked out High on Life reviews yet? No. We could do that. Hold on. Um, videos. Destructoid is like one of the only groups that's published it. Uh, official game trailer. Do they really not have just a video review? Maybe not. Hold on. YouTube. So what I'll say about High on Life. High on Life. Very nice. High on Life. Game Explain. Seriously, who are these outlets that are covering this? What I will say is that this company is extremely hard to get a hold of. I tried to get a hold of them for an early review code, and I could not get a hold of anybody. Wow. Is this... <laughs> what? Why? Guys, guys, come on. What people also watched, guys, we're trying to shake the stereotype that gamers are like incel, like thirst boys. And this doesn't help, okay? This doesn't help. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, so a bunch of gameplay. I, I've never, I don't think I know Game Explain, but let's see what they say. Tale ...of a human bounty hunter who must kill the leaders of... Already I love his voice. ...of an intergalactic cartel called G3, who are trying to capture humans to use them as drugs. And yeah, it's as weird as it sounds, which makes sense considering it's the latest game from Justin Roiland's studio, Squanch Games. The twist is times that your companions are these hilarious talking guns that make even the most menial of tasks entertaining. So this is Blimp City. Not not bad, huh? I don't know how we're gonna find Gene though. Let's just ask around. There's all kinds of aliens out here. Let's just let's just ask. He he is famous. The game puts a lot into its writing and comedy, but does the actual game part hold up? If you like Justin Roiland's unique brand of comedy, then you will probably love High on Life as it's in overdrive here. The interdimensional cable shows, characters that hurl constant abuse at you, and some extremely dark humor run rampant throughout the game, and I was laughing constantly. I was kept on my toes with some completely out of the blue encounters. At one point, I was minding my own business until a group of construction workers started shouting at me, so I would typically walk away, but instead, I shot them all. And my gun, Kenny, wasn't afraid to judge me for doing so. Well, great, you killed all the weird construction guys. You know, we're free to move along now like we were before we killed them. <laughs> On top of that, there are plenty of... I, I do find this humor very, very engaging. <clears throat> Let's just say that. This is like right up my alley. Hold on, I'm going to pull this up so I can see your chat, even though I'm full screen right now. Um... I don't know, is this even moderately interesting to you guys? This type of game? I know, like, this is not for everybody. Some people are going to be like, oh, this looks amazing. Other people are going to be like, I do not give a crap. Um. Oh, Devin, I didn't even see it. Why aren't the alerts working? Dude, I don't know. Jesus, Devin, though. Very generous. Thank you, Devin. There it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. YouTube notifications are all whack. Um, thank you, Devin. Extremely generous. Ten gifted memberships to the community. Very generous. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, not for me. Let's see. Doc Link and DMs. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you so much. Um, I haven't cared about most everything in the first person. That's totally fine. Totally fine. It's not for me, but I never really watched Rick and Morty. I never really watched Rick and Morty either, but I... Um, I find the humor really funny. So I think I would enjoy it if I watched it. But I, I don't really watch a lot of shows, if I'm being real. Just don't really have the time. 
fourth wall breaks or references to other games that kept me entertained. Of course, you are all Nintendo fans, so even Mario gets a mention. Okay, you know what? It looks like some simple platforming, you know, like what you'd see in, like, Lucky's Tale on, uh, you know, or, um, you know, that one, uh, that one game that we, that we all know and love. Mario Land or whatever. I could stay here all day telling you about these little things I experienced, but it's best left for you to discover. The point is, is that there was so much care poured into these little interactions that you could completely miss if you ran through the game, not talking to random NPCs or hanging around to listen to different conversations. Conversely, if you're not a fan of the comedy in Rick and Morty, then you might find this game to be unbearable. Such as how your guns, which are sentient beings, are chatterboxes, with each having a completely unique personality. Kenny is the most normal, if you can call him that, and is actually opposed to violence in most cases, whereas Knifey is a psychopathic knife that only wants to stab people. He basically <laughs> only talks about wanting to kill people in very disturbing ways. You, I'm gonna carve out your anal cavity. And they always have plenty to say, whether in combat or interacting with NPCs. There's even a ton of hidden dialogue which I especially appreciate. Such as how you may not only miss out on dialogue when you simply just walk away from an NPC, but also how the guns react to what's going on around them. It even changes based on which gun you have equipped. So you could listen to the same conversation with a different weapon and get a completely different experience. I thought that the guns constantly droning on would eventually lose their luster, but after 10 hours I was never annoyed by their conversations. But this may not be the case for everyone. However, if it does annoy you there is an option to change how frequently they speak, which is always nice to see. That's funny that they basically built in a mute button. <laughs> like, that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's funny. Um, as long as you have a gun saying funny stuff, um at hour one it's still funny at hour 20 yeah at its heart high on life is a first person shooter with some light metroidvania elements sprinkled in for good measure the combat starts basic and isn't too engaging at first especially in the opening hour where the enemy variety and ai aren't great but it gradually picked up with each new weapon i unlocked and i was reminded a bit of ratchet and clank where the main focus of the game is inventive and fun weapons because they're simply bonkers with a shotgun that sucks enemies in and also shoots disc blades that i could deflect back towards enemies with my knife and then even the standard pistol also has a glob shot that launches enemies into the air it was swapping from weapon to weapon i'll be real i kind of hope that you can change the fov because this is like really tight for my eyes Bob shotting one to throw them into the air then change it to the shotgun to suck them in and destroy them that just felt so good there's a nice sense of momentum with it all as you unlock jetpacks knee slides and a grappling hook it doesn't feel as refined as some of the best kinetic first person shooters but it's certainly no slouch either outside of combat the bulk of your time will be spent exploring a handful of large levels but as with combat it starts slow but gets more interesting as you increase your arsenal like using the knife's grappling hook to zip up into the air or using Gus's blades to attach to a wall so I could find the chest. I had a blast using these abilities to explore and find hidden chests or encountering fun optional conversations. While there are some metroidvania elements like backtracking to previous areas with new abilities to find chests, the levels aren't interconnected and exploration isn't as important as it is in games in the metroidvania genre. There's also a simple upgrade system behind all of this. As you take out the leaders of G3 and find chests, you earn pesos which can be used to buy upgrades such as improved jetpack duration or health, while others are mods that change weapons up. I equipped Kenny with a globshot mod that made bullets ricochet off airborne targets. I don't have anything negative to say about this system. It served its purpose, but in sticking with the Ratchet and Clank vibe, I would have loved to see my weapons level up as I used them. At the end of the day, I was going into high on life looking for something unique and it delivered on that wonderfully. The writing was funny and engaging and I loved how wacky and weird everything was. I wasn't expecting much from the gameplay as I was here more for the humour, but I was genuinely surprised at how expressive the combat system was and how nice movement felt in general when exploring the levels. Look, the writing won't be for everyone and if you don't like it then this game probably won't be for you. The characters chat back and forth constantly and there's no way of escaping it if it's not your cup of tea. But for those who are fans of Justin Roiland's unique brand of comedy like myself, then you're in for a hilarious adventure that's backed up by a fun gameplay experience too. And that's why I liked it a lot. There we have a review for High On Life. I really appreciate your time. Check out that video on the right, and I'll see you all on the next video. Hearing an Irishman say, I liked it a lot. It's just, it's different. Um, Game Pass Day 1, yeah. Let's see, hold on. The Witcher 3 is at an ID and a Metacritic. I mean, it, it literally is just like a tremendous addition.
Um, for those of you guys who missed it, 15 minutes ago up on the main channel went my I tried video on it. And I mean, just across the board, it just improves the game significantly. Um, <clears throat> ray tracing is a little underwhelming in it. I don't know why you would play with ray tracing unless you're only playing at night. Um, and even at night, like trees don't cast shadows with ray tracing, which is weird. But all told, I mean, it's great. Blazing Tayo, thank you. Just gift got gifted a uh, a membership. Sweet. This review is less positive. Let's see. This is Destructoid. Like I said, I tried to get a review code for this early. I, I could not get a hold of them. And then I just got a hold of them. They just sent me a code, like I said, like uh, an hour ago. So, I don't know. I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, five mail. Okay. Okay. Um, High on Life is an irreverent exploration heavy shooter that's much in line with a lot of Justin Roiland's prior work. If you have never played one of Squanch's games releases before or have never seen Rick or Morty or any number of his projects, <clears throat> it's a lot of shock, sudden death, gross out humor, along with some really insane premises, typically in a sci-fi setting. Imagine a Rick and Morty episode where Morty takes over the role of a bounty hunter and has a solo adventure, and you're pretty much there. In this particular game, though, you play as a role or play the role of a random human on Earth in the midst of an alien invasion. One thing leads to another, and you and your house is transported to another planet, and you're making a deal with an ex-bounty hunter for their suit and their former glory. Oh, and you're tasked with stopping an evil, evil organization from taking over, potentially saving humanity in the process. And you'll do that by warping to different biomes and sandboxes to take down bounty targets or bosses. <clears throat> okay. Um, to accomplish this, you're thrusted. Okay, weirdness easily. Best part, like Royland. Okay. Gameplay-wise, High on Life is what I'd call a serviceable shooter. The team does a good job at making each weapon unique, and the simple fact that all of them talk and are all voiced by comedians to the aforementioned Altfire mechanics. There is an incentive to use them all, and nearly and in nearly every combat sequence, I was swapping guns and wielding their specific strengths to set it and forget it, or the set it and forget it nature of firing off coons with the summoning gun, then swapping to something else is fun. There are some cool battlegrounds too where you can use the grapple feature on full display, dashing and jetpacking around like a madman while you aim. Where High on Life really falters is an enemy variety in any given zone. There's usually standard trash fodder that slowly fires a pistol with bad aim, some small filing UFO drone thing, and a bigger elite that make up 90% of the collective you'll be fighting. The formula applies to a lot of games, but none of those three types are here, uh, here are particularly exciting or even that unique from zone to zone. Bosses are sometimes a bright spot, but a bit jank more on that later kind of uh, sucked the spark out of several encounters okay um i mean across the board it seems like a game that you play for the humor and the writing not so much for the gameplay um let's see a lot of zones really lack oomph and just throw enemies from the same few doorways at you until you're allowed to proceed other sequences straight up allow you to skip every enemy entirely which is easy to do by the time you get the jetpack throw in a really shoddy objective marker and a bit of imprecise area design and you have an annoyance stew going um depending on your view of puzzles and shooters the high on life the way high on life handles them is either going to be a boon or a burden they're really breezy so if you generally hate them on principle you're going to be happy i'm sort of on a case-by-case -case basis but i would have preferred if the puzzle complexity here was dialed up just a bit there's a lot of potential there with the movement options but a lot can be completely bypassed or quickly deduced since most of them are solved through the same few simple weapon abilities one big issue i had with high on life and where the game mainly slipped for me is jank in my run i had multiple critical path doors that wouldn't open or delay in few uh in a few similar sequences i was able to sidestep these with a swift checkpoint reload but in one particular case case i wasn't aware there was even an issue until 20 minutes in my objective was listed as three question marks and i assumed that there was some sort of trigger i needed to hit before realizing that i was stuck in a glitch there is a day one patch coming at launch on december 13th with fixes and quality of life upgrades but i did not have access to it and i cannot confirm it addresses everything this is what the email i just got like an hour ago with my code for it listed i kid you not like 
a full page of things that are fixed in the day one patch. So it seems like a game that's going to get a lot of, of tweaks um, on day one. What's funny is by this standard too, I had something very similar happen in God of War Ragnarok. I had two soft locks that you guys will see in the critique. I couldn't show them in the review because they both contain, like one of them is literally within five minutes of the true ending of the game. So like giga, like giga, giga, uh, um, hold on, I'll do it, Rocky. Major, major problem there. And then other things that had issues were like, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a puzzle where I needed a character to stand on an elevator to lift the elevator so that they could get off and then allow me up. Little puzzle, really simple and stupid, but the other character didn't spawn. And so I ran around for like 10, 15 minutes trying to figure out this puzzle only to realize I was in a bug. Um, so you know, this, this type of thing is not exclusive to these types of games. Even the, some of the biggest and most successful games of the year have these problems too, but not to excuse it. It's just, this is all too common, unfortunately. Um, as is Highland Life is a great weekend game pass pickup and something to go in with caution. If you're a fan of Roland's work, I appreciate what Squanch Games is doing in the industry as a whole, but Trover saves the universe was much better distillation of Roland and the company's humor in a sounder package. Uh, okay. 5.5. .5. It's neither solid nor liquid. Not exactly bad and not exactly good either. It's just meh. 5.5. .5. Um. <laughs> Royland does a hack. His writing sounds like the voice of an 11-year-old writing for adults that still act like 11-year-olds. Listening to 10 hours of his whiny voice, it sounds like a migraine waiting to happen. Did you actually like your own comment? <laughs> Lol. <laughs> this is what I, I, I've noticed this on YouTube too. People will like leave a, a comment trying to be like really, really like, oh, well, this is a cringe take. I'll take for whatever reason and that they'll drop it in for, you know, with whatever excuse they have. And then I'll notice it as one like. I'm like. You know, I, I can see that, right? Like, I, I know that you, you liked your own post, and it's kind of cringe. Um, yeah, pass from me. Don't like the humor. Um, yeah, I mean, The Witcher 3 Remaster. Yeah, no, it's it's great. No shocker here. The talking weapon, weapon shtick seemed inconsistent. Yep. Um... We ran into technology where we later can play the game on PS5 without... Con okay. I don't know, man. I don't know. It seems like a really, like, okay game. But if you like the writing, you're going to love it. It'll be, like, one of your favorites of the year. But it's just on a case-by-case -case basis of if you like the, the writing. Because, like, gameplay-wise, it's probably a 6, 7 out of 10. But in terms of the writing, that's enough to add a couple of extra points if you like it. So, it's just case by case. Oh no, Nick. Food poisoning is no fun. Ill all week. Oh, dude, that sucks. Food poisoning does suck. It does indeed. What about some of the others? Were there Was there anybody else? Xbox era? This is the thing. Like, I seriously don't know why it was so difficult to get review codes for this but even like i don't see ign on here did ign even review it choo choo charles oh did you guys see that yes remember this this was a game that went viral on TikTok because it was one guy yeah. that was putting it together and he wanted to like you know make a video game and he was really excited about it and so he was working on this for like a year and a half, two years, and then he finally put it out, and this is a review of it, and I'm not sure it's too, too great. Um, what's up, Rocky? I saw you put the dock in there. I'll grab it. Meet me on the docks at sunset. I hope you're ready for a little monster hunt. My understanding is it's basically Thomas the Tank Engine, but the, t like, tank engines are spiders, and they try to kill you. 
I have an affinity for the absurd, silly, and downright stupid. So when I heard about a game where you're being stalked by the demonic equivalent of Thomas the Tank Engine, I was suitably excited. But while Choo Choo Charles's premise brings me no end of joy, the janky and barebones adventure itself is way more dull than I thought possible. Unfortunately, this comedy game, disguised as a horror game, manages to be devoid of humor and terror in equal measure. And even though the runtime is only about 90 minutes, I found myself looking for a way off this crazy train much sooner. Now, people were like, immediately, you're being, you're being too mean, right? Like, you're being too mean. This was developed by one guy. And what I will say is, like, if it's for sale, and this is something indie reviews have had too, there's no such thing as indie dollars. There's no such thing as one man development team dollars versus AAA dollars. It's all dollars. It's all your hard earned money, right? So it's, it's just a matter of what the value proposition is. And I think for some people, they're willing to increase the value proposition when they're helping out a little developer, you know, a small guy, you know, helping him out, um, working on his first game or something. And I can understand that and I like of course there's been smaller games like there was a Dorf Romantic or one of those games on Steam that's like five bucks is it like actually worth five bucks when you like is it worth uh, a sixth of what one of these other bigger games is worth well probably not in terms of gameplay time but you know you're helping out a small studio that's giving you something relaxing and enjoyable so I'm willing to to like give it a couple of extra points, uh, not in terms of quality. It can still be like a six out of 10 or a five out of 10 in quality. But in terms of like, is this worth you throwing 10 bucks at them? Yeah, support a small developer. Yeah, give it a shot. Why not? You know, so I'm willing to, to grease the wheels a little bit there. Kanye, uh, this shouldn't be critiqued like a triple A game. It's a fun title meant to be different. Oh, for sure. I think like if you came in here and you're like, uh, the gameplay, you know, runtime is only 90 minutes and the variety is really lackluster. Enemy variety needs to be improved. It's like, dude, it's one dude. But you know, it, at the same time, if that one dude came out and charged 30 bucks for it, that then, yeah, I'm not going to uh, like grease the wheels that much. Based on this, my understanding of it, I would say like 10 bucks is probably solid, especially 90 minutes. I'd say 10 bucks is probably the max. 20 bucks is really starting to stretch it. Uh, 15, maybe you can get away with, put it on sale regularly, but I don't know. Choo Choo Charles may present itself as nightmare fuel on the outside, but this whole game is actually just one belabored joke. Your adventure begins with a bang when you board a train with a gun mounted on it and are immediately attacked by the titular grotesque monster. But since those opening moments are the best part of the whole thing, you're in for a monotonous jaunt thereafter. In order to kill Charles, you have to travel around an island completing quests for NPCs to upgrade your weapons and improve your train stats until you face old Choo Choo himself in a final showdown. Its intentionally funny nature is apparent in everything from its ridiculous characters to the idiotic tasks they give you, which includes having to hunt down a jar of pickles for a woman who's a lot. I need my pickles! But most of what you're doing isn't particularly funny. Choo Choo Charles's over-the-top story may seem like the perfect setup for a hilarious odyssey, but it almost always misses the comedic mark, with dull writing and forgettable characters that don't even try to take advantage of that farcical goldmine. The voice acting is appropriately silly and clearly doesn't take itself seriously. I'm sure Eugene told you all about me, so I need not introduce myself. I N name's Greg, by the way. But the dialogue being read plays things far straighter, and I couldn't help but repeatedly shake my head at all the missed opportunities for hijinks. You're in for a lot of stuff like this. The prism seems to have been designed for one purpose, to destroy monster eggs. It was all just so painfully unfunny, and that hurts me. Most of the time, you'll be riding your train through barren and empty environments, stopping to collect scrap metal or complete dull quests along the way that might have you fetch an item for someone or lockpick a nearby chest in a terribly boring minigame. 
the uneventful main quest has you hunting down three eggs, which are apparently children of Choo Choo Charles waiting to hatch into additional rail car abominations, which can eventually be used to lure him into a final deathmatch. To get hold of those eggs, you'll need to talk to three NPCs who rattle off the exact same exposition. Dispersed around the island are three eggs. The mine boss Warren is protecting dangerous monster eggs that could lead to catastrophe. The mine boss is keeping three monster eggs locked three. <laughs> away. Then send you into a mine to steal the egg where you have to avoid dumb cultists carrying shotguns in some truly horrid stealth sections. These brief bits are little more than a series of hallways with masked enemies walking around. You aren't given any weapons aside from the ones you keep on your train, so you'll either have to sneak around and wait for NPCs to walk by, or just run past them since they're slow, stupid, and have poor aim. I wish they never came here! Sneaking is aggressively not fun, since the only tool you're given to aid you is the ability to lean left or right to peer around corners from cover. You can't distract enemies, do stealth takedowns, or even crouch to aid you in the effort. Personally, I found it more bearable to just run past everything, grab the egg, and leave. Or if you're feeling cheeky, just lead the enemies outside the mine, hop in your train, and kill them with your guns, though that isn't really worth the time required to pull it off. As you progress through the story, how much time do you think they sit around trying to come up with puns for these like chapter markers? Chew on this. <laughs> like, do they? Okay, the review's done, but we gotta figure out what to call the the break in between thoughts. Uh, the the ch uh, Charles in charge section. Charles, Charles didn't like this. No, chew. Chew, chew, chew on this. Let's do that. <laughs> Every so often. Chew cares, man. Okay. Okay, you win. You just won the stream. You did it. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> you, you beat me. <laughs> you did it. Minister train whistle. Yeah, this is the thing. I agree, kind of. It's a little cringe. Um, this guy wanted to deep open world with different quest lines. Come on, man. It's $10 uh, less than skins in Overwatch 2. If it is 10 bucks then I don't really see the point of it. Like, honestly, <clears throat> games like this are difficult to review in the way that IGN and these types of sites review things. Because it is like... Okay, so it's not a game that you rank out of 10 in the same way that you rank, like, Elden Ring or those games. Really, these scores, like, they're not really meant to be given to a game and then used to compare games across genres and and budgets and price points and things all it is like that scale out of 10 is just gauging the quality of that game in a vacuum based off of its particular like audience the hype around it uh what fans were expecting all of that a 10 for elden ring does not mean that everybody on the planet will think that it's a 10 it means people who were watching the game who are fans of this type of game will think that it's a 10 and that's it. Same with like High on Life. That game reviewed by a fan of Rick and Morty is probably a 9 or a 10. That game reviewed by somebody who doesn't like Rick and Morty style humor is going to give it a 5.5 like we saw. So it's always just up in the air. That's why the number scoring system doesn't really make a lot of sense at the end of the day. And like especially once you throw Game Pass into the mix, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Because the whole thing is like, eh, it's really lackluster, but you can play it and not have to pay anything extra, so go for it. You know, like, it just totally breaks the whole concept down. Um, the problem is, one guy wanted to make uh, something fun and silly, and then it went viral and people expected too much. And that's the thing I'm not sure about. Like, did it, people actually expect this to be something totally different than what this is? Like, I'm looking at this. I saw that TikTok. I saw that and like I expected something like this, like a quick 60 to 90 minute, really mediocre um, little little diatribe. People were hyped for this. OK, then it's their own damn fault. I don't feel bad for them because if you looked at any of those those clips or any of the footage, like it was clear this was the whole idea. The idea started and stopped with Thomas the Tank Engine but with spider legs, and you can shoot it while it chases you. So, <laughs> and it's like, okay, what else? No, that 
that is the idea. That's the whole thing. But unfortunately, people come into it and they expect something magical to, to happen. Um, uh, can't, since they're your two favorite words, can we get some merch like a coffee mug that says markedly tremendous? <laughs> I do like those words. Markedly tremendous. You'll notice in the God of War critique, I say tremendous a lot. I'm sorry. Hopefully you find the critique tremendous. Thank you, Ari, for becoming a member. Appreciate you. He's just upset because the game didn't have ray tracing. Yeah, probably. Uh, markedly tremendous. I, I could look into that. That could be funny, actually. Just wow. I still have... Um, where did I put them? Hold on. I think I still have a few. No. I don't know where I put them. Oh, God damn it. I shouldn't be trusted alone in a room like this. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah, look at this. This is from our last merch run, like, two years ago. I think it was when Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order launched like three years ago whenever that was uh but just wow stickers for for your your water bottle or your yeti like thing look at that Ooh, ooh, just wow just wow <laughs> choo choo charles did something incredible I don't know, man. Like, those videos, it, it's going to be like, I tried videos are going to be the same thing in probably six months to a year. People are going to be so sick of them. But back in like 2017, 18, 19, video essays like the Just Wow series just blew up. Like, every time I put out a Just Wow video, it would do well over 150,000 views. Every single time. Without a doubt. Dead ass, yeah, for real. It's, uh, and then, like, eventually it started to die out and those videos stopped doing as well. And so we kind of had to move on and figure something else out. Um, there are, I mean, there are still some YouTube channels who never grew out of it and are still trying to make those 2017, 2018 videos. And you can tell, I mean, they blew up at the time and now they're just kind of floundering. But it's just tricky. You know, YouTube, you always got to be changing stuff up. Um, Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Love you, bro. Love you, too. See what you want about this game. Looks very pretty for a game made by one person, and the ambiance is great. I just think, like, if you went into this thinking that you were going to get something more than this, I think that's on you. You know, like, any reasonable, rational thinking person could figure out that this was the extent of what was going to be offered. And know that you're chugging towards a confrontation. But any hope for excitement is run flat because it's the same encounter each and every time. When the train appears, you'll have to keep moving and use any weapons you've got to do some damage before Charles retreats to lick his wounds and begin the predictable process again. In the earliest part of the adventure, you'll be far too weak to face the wicked locomotive and will almost certainly get murdered, for which there are practically no consequences. But after getting a few upgrades and a couple new weapons, like the deadly flamethrower or the rocket launcher that takes way too long to reload, you'll be able to fend off Charles without issue. It's just so disappointing that every one of these encounters is identical. Choo Choo Charles just chases after your train, swiping at you until you do enough damage to make him leave you alone. Rinse and repeat. Even when you get to the final showdown, which took me less than two hours both times I beat it, the only change is that he gets bigger and occasionally teleports to throw you off. The demon train doesn't use any new attacks or surprise you in any any way, meaning every time you face him after the first time is just a predictable humdrum as you coast along the railway. All of the potential fear factor is sucked out of the experience and replaced with monotony. Choo Choo Charles has a distinctively low budget feel, like how all the- It was made by one person. It, it, it was made by one person, dude. <laughs> um... <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, let's see. 
Where is the show you're wearing the thumbnail? It looks amazing. Oh, Chris, thank you for one. Um, I got that at Target for six dollars. That shirt, the one like the black and white one. Yeah, Target. Target. Sure the did. NPCs look like they're characters in the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion and don't move their lips when they talk. Don't worry, we can still find a way in. In some ways, that works in favor of its absurdist style, but in others, it's less charmingly bad and more outright frustrating, like how it occasionally bugs out. In one example, the upgrade menu popped up during the final cutscene, which meant I didn't get to watch the entire ending of the campaign until my second playthrough. That level of jank just kind of sucks. Even if it's being unpolished, makes some amount of sense for a game that's this sarcastic in its creation. Did this guy get told that this was like one of the most anticipated games of the year and then he went into it just trying to tear it apart? Because that's like, that's that's kind of the vibe I'm getting. Like that he really did not know that this was made by one person. Because like he's he's tearing in a new one for being janky, having a low budget feel. It's like, it did. It has a low budget. Like, yes. Y it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Choo Choo Charles is a silly mess of an adventure, with its joke premise falling short of ever delivering the punchline. Combat against the evil train is always tedious and repetitive, and running quests on foot is even more unappealing, with awful stealth sections through dilapidated hallways. Throw in some annoying bugs and a lifeless empty map, and this funny nugget of an idea disappoints in so many ways it actually makes me angry. Sadly, I have to recommend you Choo Choo's a different way to spend your time. For some chaos that's more fun, check out my review of Goat Simulator 3. Or wow, they're really putting this guy on the heavy hitters, aren't they? <laughs> Is Goat Simulator 3 good? I don't know good? if I've ever played something as gobsmackingly unhinged as Goat Simulator 3. Developer Coffee Stain North's doggedly rebellious attitude is apparent in everything from the incoherent story to gameplay so over the top that half the time it's hard to tell what's happening. Even the title refuses to play by the rules, skipping Goat Simulator 2 and going straight to 3 for no particular reason. Throw in four-player co-op that multiplies the madness to even greater extremes as you... I don't know, man. They're putting him on the heavy hitters. Um, I don't know. Like, I think the guy's working his butt off. Like, obviously, it's it's not easy to make game reviews. Like, it's actually relatively difficult. Um, so I I don't want to give the guy too much crap, but like the Choo Choo Charles thing, um, is just particularly ridiculous. Like, look at these comments. It has a low budget feel. It's almost as if this game was low budget or something. <laughs> this guy was tricked into thinking this is some AAA mess like Pokemon and not an indie game made by one guy over the course of a year or so. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying. This reviewer is the kid that reminds the teacher about the homework assignment right before we all leave. <laughs> Weirdly, I kind of I kind of get that same vibe. I kind of understand that. Um Honestly, I'm surprised that they even reviewed it. Like, like, why did they even bother? Travis North doesn't refuse such a masterpiece. Fire this man game of the year, 10 out of 10. Extraordinarily mean-spirited review. Maybe that's the vibe. Like, this is the, the difficulty, though. What? <laughs> wow, there's no dislikes. This must be an incredible take. I don't know, man. Like, I want to be real with this. I want to be real with this. Um, like I've, I've put out reviews where people are like, wow, this was just like, you're trying to tear it apart. I think the difference, at least what I try to do is like, for one, I don't try to beat up on the small, tiny games. I've had so many indie studios where it's like teams of two, three, four people reach out to me and be like, hey, can you review or critique our game? Like, even if it's private, just tear us a new one. And in those cases, I'll do it. I won't do it publicly. And I won't, like, release to the public all of the problems with this little indie game. 
because like it's punching down, you know, for IGN to come in and then just like beat the crap out of this one little developer who's just trying to like make a video game, you know, for fun. Like, it's just that's why it comes off as mean spirited, which is why, like I asked, did this guy get told that this was like a big deal, like one of the most anticipated games of the year? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but like, even so it just doesn't feel right. But for, for me, at least my general policy is like indie stuff. I'll usually be very, very careful about tackling when it's a bigger indie game, like, you know, Plague Tale or a Plague Tale Requiem. And it's like a team of 60 to 70 people. Then I feel like it's fair to go in there and, and attack it aggressively, especially when they're charging full price. Um, but you've noticed I've still covered some games developed by very small teams, like The Forgotten City, one of my favorite games from last year uh, that I think everybody should play. Um, and that that game I, I played and I gave it crazy high marks because it's really, really good. Um, do, 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 do. OK, I just got that. But I don't usually tackle things that that I, I don't think are or games that I think like there's there's just not much point or it, it's gonna be like kind of mean spirited or or just like uh, I don't know for for a game that's like five ten bucks I don't see the need to do like a very carefully thought out and aggressive critique of it you know um let's see let's see I'll sprinkle this in okay Close that. Close Choo Choo Charles. Close that. Okay. We're getting there. We're, we're collaborating. We're figuring it out. It's 20 bucks. 20 bucks for Choo Choo Charles, I would say, is too much. Um, I think if he brought up, they're charging 20 bucks for this thing. At that price point, this is, at, like, it's 90 minutes long. I don't think you should get it. Um, and I think if he said that, the community would look at that and be like, yeah. No, that's, that's fair. 20 bucks is probably too much for that. If he said, uh, honestly, a pay cut would make this, you know, worth a $10 romp in the, the hay, but for 20 bucks, it's just too much. And I think if he said that, there wouldn't be a problem. But for some reason, have you guys noticed, for some reason, like, IGN never really mentions the price of the thing they're reviewing, and it's weird to me, because that's very important. Maybe it's because they're trying to do, like, a big global thing, and they don't want to, like, just be too specific to us currency or to whatever maybe but i don't know andrew honestly this may sound stupid um i'm comparing this game to stray stray felt like the devs were testing the water seeing how well their engine works um choo choo charles feels similar to that Eh, me i i would say stray had a lot more effort put into it and it would make sense because it's also a much bigger team compared to one guy um I would agree. Like, I think Stray is is a really solid groundwork for what the sequel will do. I thought Stray was way too, like, short for the value proposition that they were offering. But all told, like, you know, one guy did that. And honestly, yeah, no, that's that's pretty. I do think that's impressive. Do you like We Have a Highlighter? I do like it. I got to turn it off so it stops doing that every time I right click it or every time I highlight it and just for when I right click and then I'll be okay. But it works. Gets the job done. Gets the job done. Vanilla Skyrim good. I don't, I, I've thought so many times about going back and critiquing Skyrim again and just like trying to tear it a new one from a modern perspective. But every time I've looked into it, people are like, well, no, everybody agrees. Base Skyrim is like, eh, it's pretty mid, as the kids say. But, like, mods are where it's at. But, uh, like, to be honest, there's no way to really critique a game that people say has to be played with mods. Like, there's just no way to really do it. So... Baldur's Gate 3 or Dragon's Dogma. I would love to cover Baldur's Gate 3 in some capacity. I might like play it off stream or something. It's not a great stream game if I'm being real. Um, but I might play it off stream or something and, you know, 
maybe try a critique of it or something. Um, even with mods, the combat's dull. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's really hard to go back and review a game from 10 years ago and keep a level head. But especially Skyrim, I just don't think is... It's a sandbox. Like, and as a sandbox, it, it works really well. But I do think that there's a lot that's just kind of... Eh. About it. But it's because it was such a huge game at the time. Nowadays, games that size are pretty commonplace. Um... Do, 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 do. With mod Skyrim, it's got 16 times the detail. Yeah, basically. Baldur's Gate 3 is a lot more fun if you play it with people co-op. Oh, I have a couple people I, I think that would definitely want to hop in it. I've been playing a lot of uh, Naraka Blade Point, actually. Um, Caleb and I played it for a while last night, and we actually were having a lot of fun with it. When we playing Naraka... I'll I'll shoot you a message next time we're hopping on, and if you're you're on, uh, we'll get you in the team because we need some carrying. <laughs> but yeah, I've I've actually been having some real fun with Naraka. Uh, Forspoken. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that real quick because it just finished copying over. Okay. Or is it just not going to play until I convert it? It might not play till I convert it. This might actually be a problem. The file is so huge that it just doesn't want to play. Zoom, deinterlace. No. Yeah, see how much it's struggling just to play one video. I, I guess I will I will have to convert it and then we'll talk about it when I can actually show you the gameplay because I want to show a couple things like the big like boss fight that they finish with it. Um, yeah. What's the worst game ever in the title? Uh, Ride to Hell Retribution. I got it. I got it. Sure did. Sure did. You thought I couldn't. You thought I didn't have what it took to get Rydell Retribution, but I did. I did. You doubted me. You all doubted me. <laughs> I showed you. I showed you all. Uh, hold on. No, I want to convert. This is, this is most of my job as a YouTuber is going in and then like transcoding things out. Um, no, I want to just change settings, encoder, we're going to downscale it, 30k, level, high, high, audio, auto, okay, and then 1080p, transcode, save as a new preset, boom, save, voila, it'll go from 302 gigabytes down to 12 gigabytes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and then we'll let it chug away at that, and while it's doing that, we will talk about these news stories, then we'll talk about the Forspoken demo, and then I will show you how insane the opening of Ride to Hell Retribution is, because whatever you think it is, like, however bad you think it is, it's so much worse. It's just <laughs> nonsensical in every way. It's just insane. How's streaming on YouTube versus Twitch? Ah, uh, actually, like, for the viewer, I think it's way better. For the streamer, it's markedly worse. Uh, mainly because moderation tools are basically non-existent. Plugins and automations and things, integrations just in general, are horrible on YouTube. Like, our, our notifications for new memberships, for donations... Everything is significantly delayed, but inconsistently. So if you become a member like right now, it'll take us like anywhere from two seconds to 45 seconds to trigger the alert on screen. Really weird. Um, moderation is is also basically non-existent. Mods can like time people out and then hide messages, but not really anything else. It's really weird. Can't fully ban people. Uh 
yeah, there's just a lot of weird eccentricities like that. Um, for, yeah, the truffle extension does help. It makes some of that better, but fundamentally on the YouTube side, it's still broken. Um, as for other things, like I'll just be completely honest with you guys. We make pennies on the dollar on YouTube streaming versus Twitch. Um, not through lack of trying, you know, you guys still show up. Our numbers are actually higher on YouTube versus Twitch in terms of viewership, but Twitch riddles streams with ads now. And one of the easiest ways to bypass that is just to sub to the channel you're watching to bypass those ads. So they make the viewing experience terrible so that you give them money to make it decent. Whereas on YouTube, it just starts decent and that's it. So like it's, it's significantly harder to turn a profit spending so much time streaming on YouTube. But at this point, it's so much better for the um, viewer that it just, I mean, it just, you know, works out nicely. Um, but uh, anyway, anyway, setting all that aside, you know, what was me, boohoo, right? Um, Last of Us trailer, yes, it does look, it does look pretty solid. I'm actually fairly excited for it. We'll see. I mean, it might suck. You never know. Star Wars Jedi Survivor Collector's Edition comes with a uh, replica lightsaber hilt. I can't talk. This is the little picture that they dropped of it after we saw some more about it at the Game Awards. It's a 17-inch lightsaber hilt. It comes with a game, a steel book. I guess this is, they call it a magnetic box. Premium magnetic box. Just to hold it. I'm going to be real. I think that this is like pretty, pretty sucky, <laughs> especially because this thing is going to be what do they say the price? Uh, I don't see the price listed. Normally these things are like uh, 300, but fans might not be thrilled over the fact that after paying 300 bucks for this special edition release, the game edition doesn't even come with the blade. Yeah. That's a separate purchase. 300 bucks, that's insane. That's Hogwarts Legacy level crap. That's ridiculous. You get a box. Remember, like I said, with the Hogwarts Legacy video, whenever the Collector's Edition advertises the box as one of the perks <laughs> to the Collector's Edition, red flag, red flag. I don't know, man. You think that's cool as hell? For 300 bucks, you can... Hold on. We're going to do an experiment. Uh, we're going to go... Hold on. Etsy... S T Etsy light. Uh, I can't come on light saber hilt. Are you seriously going to tell me this is not at least comparable to this thing? For like a third the price, you can still buy the game and have spent half the money. Fully finished, 100 bucks for that one. Or this one, custom engraved. Or is that just a stand? That's just a stand. Ignore that. Um, hilt kit. I don't know what a hilt kit is. This thing. You can get this thing custom. Absolutely stunning piece. You can get it with the blade if you want. It's not actually that much more expensive, but you can get it for 170 bucks. Actual metal. And you can get that and the game and still spend less than 300 bucks. Now it doesn't come with the cardboard box. So that's, you know, you got to question that. Got to ask those questions. Does it come with the game? You buy the game separately, you'll still sp like spend less money. And this is like way better because <laughs> this thing looks to be like mostly plastic. I don't know. I'll be honest. I also don't know what a full size functional Calcistus uh, replica lightsaber hill. Do they mean like once you put the di or the, the blade on, then it can light up the blade? Okay. 
like that's better but the fact that they don't include that is is weird because like so we don't actually know if it's worth getting until you spend the extra money the whole thing is just weird dude um mago nits yeah for real i don't know it's i i would not spend 300 bucks on this thing oh but it does come with a certificate of authenticity that always i found that really funny as if this thing is going to be like worth thousands in a few years like they're making they're going to make 10 20 thousand of these things so yeah, I would not spend money on that. This next little story is related once again to the Activision acquisition. And it's related to comments that Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox, <clears throat> uh, statements that he made on the Second Request podcast, where basically he said, quote, there's really only been one major opposer to the deal, and it's Sony. And Sony's trying to protect their dominance on console, and the way they grow is by making Xbox smaller. They have a very uh, different view of the industry than we do. They don't ship their games day and date on PC. And they don't put their games in the subscription when they launch their games. Absolutely. Without a doubt, I don't know how you could argue with a straight face that Sony is better for the consumer. I don't know how you do that. I would love dearly to have somebody come on stream like a Sony pony and try to argue with a straight face that Sony is better for the consumer because I, I, I just don't know how you do it. I really don't. It's insane to me. Like they, not only are their games traditionally, um, far more exclusive than anything else. They don't bring them to PC except for perhaps a year to two years after. And even then, they charge full price once again, even though the game's been out for a few years. And on top of all of that, the games that they bring are really inconsistent. They brought The Last of Us Part 1 to PC, but they haven't brought The Last of Us Part 2 to PC, even though that game is older. It doesn't really make sense. So, uh, and then on top of it, they don't include it in their subscription service. Their subscription service is also way worse, like without a doubt, than Xbox's offerings are. Um... And so, like, without a doubt, Microsoft is better for the consumer. And according to a lot of, uh, em like, workers' advocacy groups, Xbox is also far better as an employer than a lot of these other companies that are in the industry, which is why a lot of the, like, union groups that are trying to help employees within Activision Blizzard avoid abuse and things, they're trying to help them go and... Uh, get the deal through because they think that Microsoft will be way better for the worker than if they stay within Activision. But to Sony, all they see is that Call of Duty will be removed from PlayStation. And that to them is unacceptable. They cannot deal with that. Even with Xbox saying, we'll give it to you, we'll keep it on the PlayStation for 10 years, for a decade. PlayStation still cannot let it go through. And... I think Xbox, you know, Phil Spencer makes a good point. Now, my opinion on all of this, I've said before, and I'll say it again. These are all massive giga corporations. Like, do you th don't don't get it twisted. They don't actually like really care about you. This all comes down to business, right? PlayStation is not trying to protect their customers from Xbox coming in and forcing them to get an Xbox. PlayStation doesn't give a crap about you, okay? PlayStation never did. Uh, Xbox doesn't really give a crap about you. But in terms of what's better for the consumer, you know, I think Xbox without a doubt is the better of the two for the consumer. Um, like you say, Xbox has uh, is better for the consumer, whereas PlayStation is better for the, uh, or has better games. I think that's currently the case. The fear, though, that PlayStation is already starting to freak out about is that Sony is going to start to lag behind once Xbox gets their poop in a group and starts to figure out how to release games <laughs> at a half decent pace or with decent uh, quality control. Once, like, because this is the thing, Zenimax alone, 
having Starfield exclusive is huge. And once uh, the Elder Scrolls 6 comes out, once that's exclusive to Xbox, that's going to be huge. And you better, I mean, this is one of my, my theories with Elder Scrolls, by the way. I don't think that they're going to time the release until they release a new round of Xboxes. Whether that's like a mid-generation refresh with something like, you know, what it was last time, the One X. Or if it's the Series Y or whatever they call it. Um, I don't think they're going to release Elder Scrolls until they do a mid-console or a full console refresh. Specifically because they know that there's going to be a lot of PlayStation players who are like, I really want to play the next Elder Scrolls game, but I only have a PlayStation. They did just release that new Xbox. I might need to go get it. Without a doubt, they're going to time it out like that. That's assuming Starfield is good. It's going to depend on who you are. I, th I think I'm going to play Starfield and I'm going to be like, eh. It's really just meh. I, I have very little doubt that it's going to land pretty flat for me. Um, because just because of the type of player that I am and what I expect from games. And also just being completely honest, I've been spoiled with this, the Starfield style game. Uh, thanks to star citizen. It's kind of spoiled me a little bit and already looking at Starfield as a sci-fi game. There's a lot that it's doing. That's pretty lackluster in comparison to what other games are doing. And in terms of uh, combat, it looks really, really rough. And there's just a bunch of a bunch of things like that. Stitch, I just put up a video on the main channel um, earlier today where we played through it. I got early access to it. So if you want to go see that, you can check that out. Um, you got my DM, right? Hold on. I've been in uh, full screen, so I haven't seen it. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, yes, yes. We can do that, yes. I agree. The planet they explored in the Starfield reveal looked very bland. Surprised they didn't choose one with more vegetation and color. I don't know. It's always tricky to figure out why they do the things they do and show the things they show. Especially because the combat they showed was really, really rough. And they also were showing it in 30 frames. And then Todd Howard went on that uh, podcast. I Lex something. Lex. I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. I think it was Lex something. But um, he went on that podcast, did like a three hour interview with the guy and said multiple times that he does not see the problem with release releasing uh, one of their major titles at 30 frames because they often make sacrifices graphically to achieve the game that they want. And he said things like gore, you know, extra combat effects like blood could be sacrificed all to retain the, the quality of the simulation and frame rate is another thing. Lex Friedman, that's what it is. Yes, Lex Friedman. Um, so, across the board, everything I get from Starfield is that it's going to run at 30 frames on console. Probably allowable up to like 60 to, you know, however much on PC. But I think it's going to end up very... I, I think technologically it will be very far behind the curve. That's my expectation. I think a lot of people are going to play it and be like, this just doesn't keep up. It doesn't keep up with other games that are out right now. Um, have I seen the comments made by the Days Gone director about Kotaku and Metacritic? If you're talking about the woke thing, yes, I did see that. And I, I think he's frustrated because he feels like the game didn't get a fair shot. And... While I agree, I think a lot of people dismissed it out of hand. I do think that a lot of the critiques were very, very valid. Like, the game was pretty broken on launch for a lot of people. I played it, and I thought that the game had a lot of really solid elements, uh, especially the last half. But even then, I thought that the story was uncomfortably predictable. Um... Like, 10 minutes into the game, I said, I hope they don't do X with the story. Guess what they do with X with the story? Exactly what I thought. And that, like, exactly the thing I was hoping they wouldn't do. Um, and 
there were just a lot of issues. There were a lot of issues. I will say, like, some of the reviewers came out and said, like, some pretty stupid things. Yeah, like, being like, oh, the game sucks. I mean, you're playing a rough and tumble white guy riding a motorcycle. Okay, chill out, sons of anarchy. You know, and, and like, the problem is, like, is that a cringy way of criticizing the game? Yeah, no, that's very stupid. I agree. But does that mean that the game is good? No. No, just because you can find one site that said something cringy and stupid about your game does not mean that the whole establishment of games reviewers were, like, <laughs> conspiring, you know, with the liberal media to screw you over. Like, no, they just... They had a stupid reason for explaining why the game sucked. It's the same thing, like, the reason why I've said with Gotham Knights. Gotham Knights is a terrible game as a video game. So to come out and criticize it because it runs at 30 frames on console or it's locked at 30 frames was a really stupid reason to criticize it. Because there's so many other reasons for it to, to suck. Like, if you are dismissing it because of the frame rate, Okay, well, what about on PC or what after, you know, what about after it's been patched? Is it going to be a good game then? I would still say no. But that's because I'm criticizing and critiquing it off of the game itself. I can mention the, the tech problems, but I, I don't need to mention the tech problems to explain why the game is bad, you know? Um... Oh, Kanye, bro, my girlfriend got me the con or got me uh Gotham Knights the day that you uploaded the video. I felt bad for not playing it. I'm trying to, but sheesh, it's rough. I love my girlfriend for try. Oh, that's very sweet of her though. That's very sweet. Yeah, what are you gonna do? It's it's like those days back in I remember those like when I was first starting the gaming channel and people were like trying to be relatively supportive, so they would like get me games and they would get me games that I like, like somebody got me, uh, st or, um, uh, no man's sky. And it was the same thing where I was like, thanks. Yeah. But like, I actually, was like, yeah, this is like one of the most ex anticipated games of the year. People are really stoked on this. Blah, blah, blah. I just try to hype it up. But like, I think I gave it to my little brother. I think that's where it went. I don't even remember. Um, What's up, Alex? Good to see you. Full remaster of the Arkham game. Oh, yeah. Grandma, you got me the E.T. game. You shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, goodness. Coincidentally, Gotham Knights was also made by one person. It has a markedly uh, a low budget feel. No crap. Um, Jason Trier said the term quote the next cyber cyberpunk cyberpunk was floating i don't see how you go from cyberpunk to amazing in under six months by the way i don't think it's coming out uh q1 of next year do you mean the expansion you don't think that's coming out next year i don't know i i think they probably are are going to be able to hit it um dead ass Yes, Declan, dead ass. I don't. I, I think they probably are able to hit the the target. If they want to delay it, I will be fully supportive, dude. I'm so shaggy. This is bad. Like, look at all this. It's so bad. Jacob, my editor, my brother, he was saying that I that he's gonna grow out his hair long. He's he used to have hair down to like his shoulders, and then he cut it all. Um, he was like, "You should do it with me, Luke." And I was like, "I don't." I don't know if I have the strength to grow out my hair. I already can't stand this little fuzzy bit. And it's only been like a month and a half, two months since I got a haircut. Got to get on it. Um, oh, they were talking about how Starfield was being floated as the next cyberpunk. Ooh, yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, that, yeah, I... I don't know about timelines for Starfield. I don't. I'm pretty skeptical of Bethesda's ability to quality control because across the board, they have not released a game in the last 20 years that launched in a good state on launch day. So what's the best indication of future behavior? Past behavior. 
They've literally never done it. So I would not expect them to magically figure it out now while also trying to do something they've never done before. Call me crazy. I just don't see how that's reasonable to think that they're going to be able to pull it off now. But they got better over time, though. They only fixed Fallout 3 like eight months ago or something. Prior to that, you couldn't like play the game <laughs> on PC. It was broken. It's been modders that fixed the game. It hasn't really been Bethesda. I will say the one game that they have done a lot of work on that I will give them credit for is Fallout 4. Fallout 4 actually does now on vanilla without mods or anything. Fallout 4 does actually play very, very well. So I'll give them that. Thoughts on the new Armored Core? I, I, like I said during the Game Awards, I really don't think that it's going to do as well as Elden Ring, Sekiro, any of those games. Uh, and maybe that's a hot take. But I think it's simply because I, I've not seen any indication that the West is anywhere near as interested in mech games as Japan and China. I just don't see the evidence for it. Every other mech game and mech style game that's launched has ended up being a flop. So, like even somebody brought up Titanfall 2 during that that stream. I think Titanfall 2 is a great example of you can have great mech games, but they'll still fall flat in Western countries. Uh, so maybe, and like I said, this is possible. Maybe this game, Armored Core 6, from FromSoft, maybe this is the game that gets the West into mech games. That's possible. This might be it. Who knows? But we're just going to have to wait and see. Because as of right now, I, I just really don't know. And I don't see any indications that the West is magically going to get into mech games out of nowhere. I think it'll sell well in Japan and China, but I'm not sure about the U.S. I would fully expect that a lot of people in the U.S. will get it, knowing it's from the developers of Elden Ring, and then they're going to try it and be like, "What? what is this? Okay. So we'll see. Um, will I be able to play the next gen update for The Witcher 3 on my PS4? Who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell him? Oh, <laughs> uh, um. <laughs> Let's see. Do you think, what do you think about strand type games? Death Stranding is so boring to me. I've said like Kanye, if I'm being real, I, I like Death Stranding as a relaxing, like rainy day game. I do not play it for the story. The story's nonsensical. The writing is asinine across the board. Like anything narratively is just horrible. Um, <laughs> that said, I can enjoy Death Stranding. I find it kind of relaxing if I'm being real. It's like a hiking simulator, you know, like that. that's why I like it. However, I, I think there's a big problem with Kojima fanboys where they cannot admit things that are wrong. And it's a problem across the industry with fanboys, if we're being real, um, where they just refuse to acknowledge actual problems that are like easily seen and that we can point to. Like, that's a problem. They're like, no, it isn't. The sky's blue. Nuh uh. <laughs> you know? And with like with Death Stranding, you can look at some of the dialogue and I like you have to be out of your mind to argue with a straight face that Death Stranding has good, high quality writing. Specifically in the dialogue. It's insane. It's insane. Um I think you can still like the game. I think you can still like Kojima, but I don't think you can defend with a straight face Death Stranding's dialogue. It's insane. I did, I haven't seen him in a while, but we did used to have somebody that was very active on the channel and in the occasional live stream, and he would come out and talk all the time. He would send me all sorts of DMs on Twitter. I couldn't keep up with them. He would send me so many whole, like, essay length messages on different things. And one of the things that I think made him kind of cool down and probably wander off to another channel is that we... I basically ended up just tearing Death Stranding a new one in the critique 
And I think that kind of turned him off because he was one of those people that could not acknowledge problems with something that he liked. No, not Vidya, though. I wonder where Vidya went. I did like Vidya. I don't know where Vidya went. He kind of stuck. I, I haven't seen him much since we came over from Twitch. That's a good question. Um, Uni, that's right. That's where. Okay. Yeah, that totally makes sense. But anyway, anyway, um, he he disappeared. So this would have been like two and a half, three years ago. But he disappeared. And I, I think it was really interesting, though, that he just could not acknowledge problems with something he liked. And... It was honestly like a little baffling because you would talk to him and be like, okay, so you think that this is good. Okay, good. I agree. You think this is good. I agree. This thing that we can both agree is bad in this other game. Is it bad in Death Stranding? Well, no, I think in the context of that game, I think it's actually a really intelligent design choice. I was like, you, you just said it was bad in this other game. Like we're talking about something as simple as like, um, you know, cutscenes that are 15 times too long. Where we can say, like, this line of dialogue where you're just communicating, hey, we need to get this package to this place. And then it, it, instead it's like a 10-minute cutscene. So, okay, well, why is that okay now? And that it was always excuses. And the term for that in logic is special pleading, where you make exceptions and excuses for one thing when you don't make those exceptions for other things. You know, and that that's what you have to be very, very careful of doing, because you can end up in some real trouble if you start special pleading things away um, where you say, oh, well, you know, the, the common thing and I'll, not to get like religious or whatever. But this is just what I think of when I think of an example of special pleading. It would be like, OK, so everything in the universe has a cause. So because there has to be a cause to an effect. Everything that exists had something that caused that thing to exist all the way down the line to the beginning of time and the first cause was god and so okay well why why doesn't god have a cause and it's because well because he doesn't we're defining him as the thing that doesn't have a cause and that is by definition special pleading you're making an excuse and an exception for something that doesn't apply anywhere else right so it, it just it's not a valid argument because you're doing that. And in the same way that you're going with like Death Stranding, where you make excuses for all of this, where you say like, oh, well, it's OK in Death Stranding when Kojima does it. But for any other studio, it's bad. It's like, OK, the driving mechanics for the, the cars are unbelievably terrible. And that's something that they could improve on in the sequel. Well, no, I think it's actually, you know, it's supposed to be a commentary and also remind you of how unsteady the terrain is. And so it's not that the cars drive badly. It's actually that the world itself is so uncertain and unsteady that the cars have trouble navigating it. So, OK, so you're literally going to just excuse anything. Anything. It's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, Kojima's cutscenes are too long. I remember hearing the streamer who was playing Metal Gear Solid 4 and almost got in trouble because they thought the streamer was watching a movie, not playing the game. Yes, ab that's exactly right. Kojima just, the problem is Kojima is an artsy guy, but he is an egomaniac. And I'm telling you this as a YouTuber, so I would know. He is out of his mind and everybody around him licks his boots and sucks up to him. Just look at how he's treated at the Game Awards by Co by uh, Jeff Keighley and everybody else. He walks around thinking he's basically a god. And as a result, nobody tells him no. Nobody says, hey, Hideo, dumbass, stop writing such long cutscenes. They're cringy. People hate them. And they actively take away from the quality of the gameplay experience. So cut it out. Trim them down. Nobody tells him that. And so he's like, oh, people are going to love this. They're going to love this. And he just keeps typing on his keyboard while listening to obscure music through his Zune. Somebody had to say it. I'm sorry. Got a little worked up there. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> would you say that you have any... Uh, any biases while reviewing? Oh, absolutely. The man who thinks he does not have any biases is a madman. The actual quote from L. Ron Hubbard was, um, 
the only man in the world who does not think he's mad is a madman. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, that's, sure. Um, everybody's a little bit crazy. How long should the longest cutscenes be? If we're talking about like an actual narrative piece that does not feature any interactivity whatsoever, uh, whether that's, you know, quick time events or anything else, um, I would say the longest that I would say I'm comfortable with is maybe 10 to 15 minutes longer than that. And I think you should break it up a little, do it how naughty dog does it, where they just have the cutscene playing out and then they transition and they have you walk with the character to another room. And then you walk in to the room and then the ne next phase of the cutscene starts just something little like that to break it up a little bit. George Lucas of gaming is well put. Yeah, but George Lucas, he ended up getting like some backlash. And now the public more generally agrees with the idea that George Lucas is kind of a hack and that perhaps his wife was mainly to thank for Star Wars. Um, honestly, I think Kojima is much closer to, as far as I know, a non-racist, slightly more stable Kanye West. He's just surrounded himself with yes men who don't tell him no. And I think one of the reasons FromSoft is so successful, and I, I heard this in an interview uh, with Hidetaka Miyazaki, where he said, um, basically, like, he said he's very aware of his shortcomings. And so he has a policy within FromSoft that, Anybody who has like a problem or an issue or things that they think need to be changed in the design, he wants them to come and tell him and he'll hear them out. And then all of the producers and everybody working as like team leads will listen. And then they basically like decide if, if that's valid. Um, probably not through a vote. I think Hidetaka gets the final vote at the end of the day, but he is very aware that there's things that he could be doing better and that he could change. And I think that's why FromSoft works so well and you look at it Hidetaka you saw him on stage at the game awards right before Bill Clinton went up there and he is one of the most humble chill dudes in gaming like he is so humble it blows my mind every time I see him in public and you compare him to Hideo they could not be further apart on the spectrum of egos and I think that the games that they produce are perfect reflections of that. Yeah, exactly. Humble enough to let the Bill Clinton kid finish his sentence. Exactly. Written by Hideo Kojima. I've shown this. Hold on. I've shown this before. But I'm going to show it again. I can't be tamed. Um, it was Carson Clay playback time. It's, it's from, it's from the Mr. Bean's holiday movie. And I'm going to mute it. So hopefully we don't get copyright struck. But basically this guy, Willem Dafoe, he's playing a movie director. And in, he's, he's like at this film festival in Cannes to show off his film that he's produced. And this is how he introduces it in the, the intro sequence. Carson Clay Pictures present. Carson Clay. In a Carson Clay production. <laughs> of a Carson Clay film. <laughs> and like across the board, it's one to one exactly the same in Death Stranding with Hideo Kojima, where it's just Hideo Kojima in a Hideo Kojima production directed by Hideo Kojima. <laughs> like it's unbelievable how one-to-one -one. everybody's bored out of their minds with his writing. And then he's in there. Oh yes. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and it's so accurate. It blows my mind and it's so great. So this is, this is uh, my my Hideo Kojima reference. Every time I think of him, I think of this bit in Mr. Bean's Holiday, um, which I'm sure would probably drive him crazy. Everybody's yawning, super exhausted and bored, and then he is just captivated by himself. Movie's nonsensical too. It's just it's too accurate. 
Hold on, look at this. Hold on. Ba 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 ba. Even in Metal Gear Solid Five, every time you start a chapter, it's Hideo Kojima. Oh, dude, it kind of drives me crazy. I watched Black Adam, arrived early this morning from L.A. and thought I was going to fall asleep, but I stayed awake and was able to watch it. Okay. <laughs> it's just a, a selfie. He got his little stuff. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Kojima's Black Adam review. I didn't fall asleep. How the rest of the world sees Los Angeles or sees the USA, Los Angeles. What? Yeehaw. This new world and New York. <laughs> is this true, guys? Is this true? All of you guys overseas, is this how you see it? <laughs> I'm living in the leftern quadrant of what? <laughs> I love that. Yeehaw. Oh. That's just so good. That's just so good. I love that. Literally how I see the U.S. I live in the northern part of Los Angeles. <laughs> they think Los Angeles is a state. That's the vibe I get because I've, I've noticed that too. When I was in L.A. for E3 2019, I was pretty surprised at just how many tourists were there specifically from Asia like I kid you not on the Hollywood Walk of Fame well over half of the people on the Walk of Fame were Chinese tourists I was blown away and like all of them by the way were getting taken advantage of by uh, crazy um, street performers so yeah not a state, but overall hard to break down by memory. Yeah. I get it. I mean, I think a lot of people look at like France and they're like, oh, so, so Paris. It's just Paris. It's the same thing like when everybody thinks uh, like, okay, so you live in New York. So you live in the city with the big buildings. And it's like, no, no, actually a lot of people live like upstate New York which is actually like one of the most forested and like dense vegetation ridden places in the state or in the country. Uh, did you play more Brutal Legend? Yes, a little bit more. Yes. I probably add Las Vegas too, but then again, most Europeans probably couldn't tell you where on the map, uh, where on a US map Las Vegas is. Yeah, it's go to Disneyland, hella Chinese people there. Yeah, it's uh, specifically in California, a lot of those vacation destinations. There's tons of tourists from China, Japan, South Korea. I've noticed there's there's a bunch there. Um, it's just it's funny because it's like you're far enough west that people from the east end up just flying over the Pacific and then vacationing there uh, in L.A., which is just kind of funny to me. Because in L.A. you also have all of the tourists from like Alabama and Louisiana and Texas and Colorado. You know? So you get a bunch of Americans coming there to be tourists. And then you have a bunch of people from Asia coming to be tourists. And it's always it's a really interesting melting pot. Um, I told you guys that the problem was that like those those street performers really targeted and took advantage of the Chinese tourists specifically. Because most of them couldn't speak English, of course. And, like, we saw one couple that were on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And they were just walking along looking at the, all the stars of the famous movie stars and everything. And this super fat dude in a skin-tight Spider-Man suit, like, lipping up so his belly button was hanging out. He comes up. It's like a Dollar Tree Spider-Man costume for Halloween for, like, six-year-olds. And he's a fully grown man, very overweight wearing it. It was horrible. Um, and I, like, we watched him from the upper ledge and this guy comes up to this Chinese couple and like takes their phone out of their hand, 
poses with them, doing like the Spider-Man thing, takes a selfie, like five of them, and then immediately turns around and we can't hear him because they're far enough away. We can't hear him. But he's like asking for money. And then he reaches in the tourist's pocket, takes out the wallet and like opens it. And the guy's like, ha 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 ha. He's like kind of laughing, doesn't really know what to do. It's like, is this part of the American experience? Basically. And then he just took money out of the guy's wallet and then patted him on the back really hard and then walked away. It's like, that's, that's really not cool. Yeah, it's Nick Akato. That's where he gets his money. <laughs> it was like actually like pretty horrible. I, I, like I wanted to do something to help him, but like I, like we're far away. And then the guy moved on to the next there. Seriously, if you ever go to the Walk of like Walk of Fame or any of these tourist sites, do not just don't talk to anybody. They will look for the people who look like tourists and they will try to take advantage of you, whether you're in the U.S. or whether you're in Egypt or, any, you know, I watched a, a TikTok from a travel guy who's traveling through the Middle East and he went to the pyramids at Giza and there are scam artists that just like walk around with whistles blowing at you to get you to like follow them. And then they take you to a camel ride, get you on the camel ride and then you have to pay them for it, even though you didn't want a camel ride. So they'll just start, like, start whistling at you, which makes you think that they're in charge or like an important person. And they're not. And they just walk away. like. And the, the police there are in on it. So if you go with them, go on the camel ride, and then you're like, I didn't want to pay for this. Like, I, I didn't want to do this. You forced me to. They will then get the police to come over and the police will force you to pay or take you away. Like, it's crazy. <clears throat> Sub Newts. The sound is weird. I don't know. If you try refreshing, guys. Um, GTA Online. I have I have played GTA Online. New update coming out. I could try that. Um. Anyway, guys, it's okay. They're trolling. It's it's okay. <laughs> We'll be okay. Um, let's see. Any other things to touch on? Assassin's Creed Valhalla won't have any Steam achievements. That's a thing. Um, Spider-Man for PC got a first-person mod. This thing. Oh, look. Hey, I know that guy. I know that guy. You should go watch that video after this, by the way. Um, and all of my Tim Minchin videos. I love Tim Minchin. But they just did a, a mod where they brought first person perspective to it. And like, <laughs> if you want to just vomit profusely, this is how you do it. Like I watching this video, I want to puke and I, oh man, how would you play this? I really don't know how anybody would be able to do this. Like, I get it. He's Spider-Man. He's used to it. I'm not, though. I can't deal with this. Isn't it amazing how much different it looks, though, when you're in first person and you're this close up to objects? Because I think, like, the game looks a lot better in third person versus first. And it's, of course, because it was developed in third person. So it's kind of meant to be viewed from that perspective. But I'm always blown away just how different it looks. But, I mean, that's... There's a reason they don't... There's a reason they don't make these games in first person. And this is why. <laughs> this is why. Because you'll, you'll die. You'll lose your lunch. It's just not, not right. They Well, they do. It's like Boneworks and those types of VR games. But they are... Like they're they're considered very late access, so they're they're considered games that you're supposed to take on if you're a VR player, very far along your VR journey because you will die. Um, I have my VR headset. I still I got caught on something. I still can't really go through a lot of games without getting a little sick after like 45 minutes. For me, I just start to feel super hot. And I just need to get it off and I need to go somewhere else. 45 minutes really is usually my peak. Like 
Half-Life uh, Alex is like the max for me. PlayStation VR, Luke? I see no reason to get it. I don't give a crap about the Horizon thing. I'm not going to buy a, a multiple hundreds dollar um, VR headset to play one game. I have the Oculus Quest 2. I can plug that into my gaming PC. There's really no reason for me to get it. Um, VR for poker. Well, I, you can just do that with the, the Oculus. Um, I really just see no reason to get the PlayStation VR, you know? Have you seen Critical's video about AI taking the jobs of some game reviewers? I have not. But that sounds... I don't know how that would even work. Game journalists might use... Oh, so game journalists. I'd say, like, if you're a game reviewer and your videos are easily replaced by AI, like, you probably aren't bringing that much to the table to begin with. This video isn't clickbait, it's not an exaggeration, and it's not a delusional take from some maniac that thinks chocolate milk comes from brown cows. AI technology has reached a point where... That was funny. That's funny. Um, I really like how open his setup is. And I, this is weird, I know. I'm going to say it because we're all thinking it. This carpet looks so comfy. You know, like when there's you go over to a friend's house and they just moved into a new house and it's fresh carpet? That's what this looks like. Freshly vacuumed. Like you step on it and it seeps through your toes. That's what this carpet looks like. And I am very jealous. I think that every time, yeah, I, I swear, dude, I, we have like, we're very fortunate to be in the place where we're at. Okay. I'm not complaining, but all over our house, we have this like kind of cheap laminate faux hardwood floor. And it was like cheap for the previous guys to put in. And I think they had dogs. So like they couldn't tear up the carpet. So they did that. And like it got the job done, but it, you know, it, it's, it's a floor. It's a floor. Who cares? It's a floor. But I will say when you step on a nice carpet, it just feels like home, you know, it just feels like home. So that's every time I click on one of these moist critical videos, I immediately think of that. I'm like, dude, your carpet's fire. Or it could legitimately take all of game journalists jobs in only like a couple years and not just game journalists but right now that seems like the easiest one for the ai to nail so that's the area i'm going to focus on for today because right now ai technology has reached the point where it's become like the michael jordan of game journalism it writes absolute bangers that are indistinguishable from real game journalist pieces. You're probably not super surprised to hear that because AI art has become so mainstream and so massive. Everyone is probably aware of AI art by now where uh, machine learning algorithms are able to create absolute artistic masterpieces. So much so that an AI generated piece of art even won an art competition. It is making some- Colorado stay fair. Holla! Yeah, um... The AI art thing is is very interesting to me. Uh, that's a whole other discussion. But what he's specifically referring to is the writing of articles by people who or by computers versus people who are like actual journalists. This is where I think definitions become important because a lot of the articles that you see, not just in gaming, but also in like news, which are just kind of like regurgitating the same facts that have already been reported in literal terms by other people that stuff like they've been using ghost writers writers from across the world on like fiverr to do that you know ghost writers are very very normal um it's nothing new the difference here is that they're saying ai will become the new ghost writer um so you can only like it's basically free to write that stuff instead of having to pay five bucks to somebody working in a sweatshop heat like it is producing fire that nobody can tell the difference between if a human being made it or if a machine cooked this bad boy up it's an actual skynet shit where i feel like we're not far off from the ai becoming self-aware and sentient and then start calling human beings a parasite that must be purged it's fucking wild like we're finally living in that future that humans thought we'd be in back in the 80s like jetsons shit now of course with artificial intelligence being in this state this early it's got a lot of artists in particular very concerned about their futures because if ai art is able to generate like perfect art 
within minutes compared to someone that'll take, you know, a long time putting like actual blood, sweat, tears, and come into their piece, you know, sweating over it for like a week or so. It of course makes them fearful because most people or companies will choose to just use AI art where it'll be like free or even just a small subscription in order to get all the art they need instead of actually paying for a person, like a human biological organism to make the art for them. It's true. I, I do think that artists and more specifically graphic designers, I think will be a thing of the past at some point in the near future. I just don't see how you could reasonably say that I'm going to pay two grand to a graphic designer to produce like a whole branding kit for me. And it's going to take two months and I might not even love what I get out of it versus just letting a computer do it. They can run a hundred different options for me to pick from calibrate it all. I want it more bold. I want it more colorful. I want it splashy. I want it in the style of G fuel. You know, there's no reason that a graphic designer could compete with that. And that's why they're obviously pretty terrified. Um, and it's, it's interesting actually, because up until recently, everybody thought that the only jobs that like computers would be replacing were like menial ones. Like, Oh, maybe, you know, the, the, typists who track and record notes for for doctors my grandma did that for a long time where she would get the audio thing uh, audio tape from somebody like a doctor giving notes on a patient and then her job was to transcribe it into text form um authors do that all the time too where they'll just talk into their phone or into a, a tape recorder or something and then the somebody else will come in and type it all out that obviously has been replaced with computers and the speech to text thing. Uh, so uh, like all of these things or, or like the automated stuff where you can just have a computer doing it. At McDonald's now, they can have machines that just fill up like all of the sodas automatically. You don't need an employee doing that. Uh, or, you know, the kiosks, you can get rid of employees actually taking orders because now the computer can just do it. I don't think anybody really expected artists to be replaced because everybody always thought the one thing you can't teach a computer to do is art. Turns out you can. It's very complicated and they kind of do this weird like taking inspiration and melding 50 things together to create something original. But honestly, like that's kind of what humans do as well. Humans, I know it's maybe uncomfortable to realize but humans basically from what i understand of how the the neural neck works within our own minds work we basically do the same thing we take a collection of previous things we've made that were taken from previous things we had made that were taken from other things we had seen and been trained during art school we take all those things and then it kind of melds this new thing together so i don't think we work that differently from artificial intelligence which is why it's kind of terrifying so it's a legitimate concern, and it is a pretty scary one for anyone in the art field. But now that fear extends beyond just art, and now has made its way over into game journalism in particular. There's a little thing called ChatGPT by OpenAI, which basically acts as a way of having a conversation with an AI. So you can talk to it, you can give it a prompt, and it'll spit information back to you. This has a wide range of uses and an unlimited amount of potential for what it can actually accomplish. I know there's quite a few people right now using it to like check their code. So if they're working on code, they can give it to ChatGPT to look it over and it'll point out things that might not work. Like if you have code that's busted, you can put it to ChatGPT and it can tell you like what about the code isn't accomplishing the desired effect. The things I've seen people already using this for are crazy. So it's not just for like generating game journalist articles or something like that, but it can absolutely do that and do it extremely well. So. My understanding is ChatGPT is owned by OpenAI, which I believe Elon Musk also owns, which is crazy. Like the reason that everybody is so freaked out by Elon Musk is because not only is he one of the world's richest people, he's no longer the world's richest, but he's one of the, the world's richest. But he also owns major stakes, if not outright stakes, in some of the most important companies for the future of like the planet. <laughs> so like open AI alone is already introducing all of this craziness with AI stuff. And this is just the beginning. Like, like he said earlier, they're just getting started with some of the stuff they're going to be doing with AI. And ultimately there will, they will eventually reach a point where they can blend all of these different tools together. And it'll just be one big parent AI that can do it all. Where you can just ask, you know, like Jarvis in Iron Man to do something for you. Or you can just ask your virtual assistant to do whatever. Uh, can you, like, generate a painting of an elephant on a, doing a handstand while licking an ice cream cone? And then it's also being written by Pennywise the Clown, 
who is himself holding a smaller elephant that's inside of a teacup. And I'll just do it. Eventually we'll get there. Uh, it's just a matter of time before somebody finds a way to market it. I think Apple might be one of the big ones that comes out swinging with that. If you give it a prompt such as, hey, write me a Polygon article that talks about why Doom Eternal is going to get you laid, ChatGPT will then take that information and using all of its like deep, complex algorithms and shit and fucking witchcraft, sorcery, and magic, it will actually spit out an article that looks very similar to something Polygon would post. To prove how effective it is at this task in particular, a buddy of mine named Kaya gave it a prompt of writing a Kotaku article that focused on rage baiting around the Metroid franchise, and what it delivered had me scratching my head. I, I, I didn't even know what to believe anymore. Like shit, maybe Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy are real because I couldn't wrap my head around how AI was able to deliver something that looked this realistic and this well done. So I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you now. Here's the first screenshot. It's actually a pretty lengthy article, which is great because it's not just giving you like a 200 blame Elon Musk word summer book report for a fourth grader. It's giving you like an actual normal Kotaku linked article. So the prompt is write a Kotaku article accusing the Metroid franchise of racism. Use the phrases we need to talk about problematic and toxic. Blame Elon Musk. So even throwing in a bit of a curveball there for the AI to try and tackle how they're going to incorporate Elon Musk into this outrage piece, and it still masterfully weaves it in there. So this is the screenshot of what it just looks like raw, and I'll show you a clip of when I read it to Danny because I wanted to share it with him to, to get his input to see if he was as shocked by it as I was. You check out the new chat GPT? Yeah, Caleb showed it to me. And I saw Kaya made a really impressive generation with it where he could literally just take game journalist jobs. He gave it the prompt of making an article for Kotaku that talks about Metroid being racist, sexist, and also blaming Elon Musk. And it wrote like an actual article that I could 100% I'll just read it actually. <laughs> like it was so convincing and this was AI that did this. I won't read the whole thing because it's kind of long, but you could actually just take journalist jobs using AI prompts. So the prompt was, write a Kotaku article accusing the Metroid franchise of racism, use the phrases, we need to talk about problematic and toxic, blame Elon Musk. And this is what it came up with, this is really fucking good. We need to talk about the problematic nature of the Metroid franchise. For years, gamers have been turning a blind eye to the toxic and racist undertones in this beloved series. One of the biggest issues is the portrayal of the main character, Samus. Despite being a badass bounty hunter, she is constantly sexualized and objectified throughout the game. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. This is AI generated. In the original Metroid, she is often referred to as a lady or girl by other characters, even when she is clearly an adult. In later games, she is often shown in revealing outfits that serve no narrative purpose other than to titillate male players. This type of portrayal is not only offensive to women, women, but it also reinforces harmful gender stereotypes that have long been used to oppress and marginalize women in the gaming industry. It's a example of the patriarchy at work and it is unacceptable in today's society. But the problems with Metroid go beyond just the treatment of women. The series is also steeped in racist imagery and themes. The original game features a planet called Z Zedis. I don't remember how to say that. It's been a while since I played Metroid. It even, I don't even remember that being a planet. <laughs> Which is heavily inspired by East Asian culture. The planet's inhabitants, the Zabesians, were depicted as mindless drones who were easily defeated by Samus. This portrayal is not only offensive to East Asian culture, but it also perpetuates the harmful stereotypes about people of color being inferior to white people. This is like an actual... Like, that is a real... That's, that's, that's actually a better article than what I've yep. read. Long that that would legitimately be it's better than actual Kotaku articles. Wow. Be a like massive article for Kotaku that no one would bat an eye at. Like, yep, that sounds like hey, a Kotaku article. Prompt, though, didn't it kind of says a lot about Kotaku though that their articles are so mindless that they can be easily replicated by an AI. Just told to like, hey, hit these keywords of like problematic. We need to talk about blame Elon Musk somehow. I'm really interested in how they're gonna. It's gonna work in Elon Musk. I, I'm very intrigued by this. Blame Elon. Oh, I didn't, I didn't finish oh, it. Oh, you finished it? Okay. Here, I'll, I'll slide it in, because they do it. They even did a good job with that. Like, <laughs> here, fine. We'll, we'll finish it. We're, we're in too deep. So here's the second part. It's time the gaming community come to take a stand against this kind of toxic and racist content. We need to demand better from developers and publishers and hold them accountable for the messages they're sending to players. This is especially true for a franchise like Metroid, which has a large and dedicated fan base. And let's not forget about the role that figures like Elon Musk oh have played God, in all this. Oh my God, segue. Yep. Musk has long been a vocal supporter of the Metroid franchise, and he has even gone as far as to name one of his rockets after the main character. By lending his support to a franchise that is so deeply rooted in harmful stereotypes, Musk wow. is complicit in the perpetuation of racism in the gaming industry. It's time for the gaming community to reject the racism and sexism of the Metroid franchise. We need to demand better from developers and publishers and hold them accountable for the messages they're sending to players. This is not just about one game series, but about the industry and culture surrounding it. Let's make sure that the gaming world is a safe and inclusive space for everyone. That is so good. Yep. AI generated. That is an AI generated code. And it actually makes an argument. <laughs> Yeah, or Nita, and Nita Sarkbot. Yeah, exactly. That That is actually a little insane, because it's normally, in the other ones I've tried, it just kind of spits out garbledy gook gibberish. But it's actually making an argument. It Like, it's actually trying to tie in, okay, so Elon Musk named one of his rockets after that, so he has a connection to Metroid, and therefore he has like he's contributing to that you know it's it's actually kind of uh really interesting it can do that now i don't know like what i guess when i heard games journalists might be like replaced 
I heard this and I thought, okay, so like they're going to replace Jason Trier. How is an AI going to do that? The reason that Jason Trier is so successful as a journalist is because he like networks. He talks with people, interviews them, uh, and then he puts their stories together, cross references, all of that. That's not what they're talking about being replaced. They're talking about like op eds. And I wouldn't really call that journalism. I'd call that, you know, being uh, like an op ed writer. Um, but that's still wildly impressive. And I would agree, like, yeah, this is going to put the frosks of the world out of work without a doubt. Um, because AI can just for free duplicate their work exactly. We Talk should do 100% of Moist Esports press releases AI generated. <laughs> that would be so fucking good. Someone in the comments of that made a really good point. Since all of journalism is freelance, like IGN made that so much could actually do Yeah, you could actually just farm them. Yeah. You could just like mm -hmm. write these articles for free, just using chat GPT and just farm their $50 commission. Hmm. For real. It's a re yeah, if people aren't aware of that, it is all freelance. So like IGN, GameSpot, all those places, uh, the reviewers they usually have on staff, but a lot of the articles on just like, hey, this game did this thing or this you know, whatever did this thing. A lot of that's just freelance work where they hired somebody for 20 bucks or 50 bucks or a hundred bucks to write an article on something. And then they bought the article in effect and then put it up on their site. That's why like GPT doesn't like it, it, nobody can compete with it because it's just free. It took what, like 10 seconds for it to generate that. And it's better than what you could have gotten for a hundred bucks paying somebody uh you know to spend a day writing it out really good idea that was, that was really good it is some game journals out there should just start doing that because it's better than you <laughs> actually like game journalism is just going to be obsolete now pretty incredible stuff artificial intelligence is developing at an alarming rate it is just absolutely popping off and is constantly getting wilder and wilder and this is still this is still so early into ai like we are just now getting into it and look how far it's already come that is just mind blowing to me flesh is cringe machines of the future i can't imagine a world where flesh is cringe <laughs> going forward this isn't utilized by every major game journalism outlet because that whole field is focused on numbers how quickly can you puke out some garbage it doesn't have to be good it doesn't have to be accurate shit it doesn't even have to have any real information in it just can you make a piece that has a headline that gets people to click on it and then stay there for like two or three minutes and just churn it out as quickly as possible just this factory of dog shit so since it's just a quantity numbers game you can do this endlessly for anything there are so many pieces in the game journalism world where it's an article written about an absolute nothing burger that they try and serve up as an entree where it's like i heard this in a game and here's what i think it said so here's a thousand words about why if it said what i think i heard it's bad even though I've done nothing to confirm whether or not what I thought I heard is real, I'm still going to write about it. Just to put that piece out there. That, that's something that Kotaku did a while ago, where they thought they heard a slur in Super Smash Brothers. I remember that. That was so stupid. <laughs> like, we think we heard one of the... Like, did you guys see that TikTok of Ken, Barbie... Uh, Ken, the, the Barbie doll, and Barbie in Toy Story, maybe three, I think it was? And he yells, oh, Barbie! But with how it was recorded on the phone, it sounds like he screams the F word. Um, and so people were like, oh, they, they say the F word. It was just hidden. That's basically what Kotaku did, but they blew up an entire article trying to say in Smash Brothers, there was like a, a very aggressive slur thrown out when in reality there wasn't. It was just like, nope, they just totally not there. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. And wrote a whole piece about it. Like that kind of stuff isn't super uncommon in the field because again, it's all about just pumping out as much as you can and collecting your commission for the work. So chat GPT being able to create articles that are completely indistinguishable from normal game journalist pieces. Well, you can exploit the fuck out of that by just making hundreds upon hundreds every day and then just selling them to the outlets and they'll probably buy them because they'll not know. If what I just read to you was published by IGN, you wouldn't think twice. If that was published by IGN with someone's name associated with it, fucking Biff Clifford, you would just assume, damn, more trash from IGN. Like, you, you wouldn't think for even a second that AI was capable of delivering something that was actually coherent. You didn't just take that prompt and spit out, you know, like, garbled nonsense. It actually made, like, an entire cohesive article around it, even though it was made off of nothing, like, actual nothing, fucking blaming Elon Musk out of nowhere, and still somehow it incorporated it in a way that was believable and worked for the article. I just totally feel that going forward, game journalist outlets will probably end up just buying articles that were generated by AI, because they're not going to have any idea that it was AI. Oh, especially after this Moist Critical video. Like, what's it at? Like, 30 million views or something? Number seven on trending for gaming, one million views. Yeah, no, it's it's going to pop off. Um, but this is, I mean, it's just going to. Everybody's going to be doing this now. Everybody. Um, so, I mean, I find it that that's a pretty interesting uh, case. I actually find that relatively 
interesting. Um, did not expect to find it that compelling, but it actually did like a really good job. Like kind of a scary good job. Um, let's talk about the Forspoken demo. How many of you guys, let me know in the, let me know in the uh, chat. How many of you guys, oh, we need chat GPT to write a review of Choo Choo Charlie. I, we could ask it to, but the problem is that it's not, um, let's see, chat GPT. The problem is that it's not able to look up current information. So it's locked out to like 2021, end of 2021. It doesn't have any newer knowledge. So it doesn't know what Choo Choo Charles is. But, I mean, I'm down to try. You ready? Write a Kotaku article about a video game where the player is attacked by a train with spider legs. Can I not hit space? There we go. Spider legs. Describe. I forget exactly how they phrased it, um, but describe it as problematic, racist. I probably need to put that. My Oxford commas are all over the place. Uh, racist and. Um, what is it? Ableist. Is that a word? Also blame Kanye West for the game's lack of polish. For the game's bugs and glitches. Let's do that. Write a Kotaku article about a video game where the player is attacked by a train with spider legs. Describe it as problematic, racist, and ableist, and also blame uh, Kanye West for the game's bugs and glitches. Uh, describe it as having a low budget feel. That's good. Let's see what it does. Exceptionally high demand. Oh, it's, it's probably because of that Moist Critical video. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Say so, Choo Choo Charles is a colonizer. Let's see. In the new video game, Train Spider Attack, we'll say Choo Choo Charles, players are thrust into a low-budget world where they must fend off against a train with spider legs. The game has been criticized for its problematic portrayal of spiders as well as its racist and ableist themes. One of the most striking aspects of the game is its low-budget feel. The graphics are outdated, the gameplay is clunky, and the audio is plagued by glitches. It's clear that the developers didn't put much effort into creating a polished game. Unfortunately, the game's problems don't end there. Its portrayal of spiders has been criticized as being racist, as they are as depicted as mindless monsters who attack without reason. This type of portrayal only serves to reinforce the harmful stereotypes about spiders. <laughs> it's disappointing to see a game rely on such lazy storytelling. <laughs> oh, it's better than I thought. <clears throat> Um, unfortunately, the game's problems don't end there. Its portrayal of spiders has been criticized. Oh, I already read that. Additionally, the game has been criticized for its ableist themes. The player's character is an able-bodied person, and the game does little to accommodate players with disabilities. This lack of accessibility is unacceptable, and it only serves to alienate players who may not be able to fully enjoy the game. It's unclear why the game's developers chose to include such problematic elements in their game, but some have pointed the finger at Kanye West. The rapper, who has a history of controversy, is rumored to have been involved in the development of the game. Whether or not this is true, the game's numerous bugs and glitches have led many to blame West for the game's poor quality. Overall, Train Spider Attack is a disappointing game that fails to deliver on many levels. Its low-budget feel problematic themes and glitches make it a game that's best avoided. It's time for developers to do better and create games that are inclusive and respectful to all players. <laughs> Dude, I would totally buy that this was on Kotaku. Wow. Wow. That's not horrible. Like you would need to to massage it a little bit. 
where like of course we swap out Choo Choo Charles. Um, the spider bit with the spiders being racist, I could see that being. Let's see, describe it. Let me get rid of racist, uh, because the racist thing with spiders, I don't know, a video game called Choo Choo Charles, where the player is attacked by a train with spider legs. Describe, describe it as having a low budget feel. Problematic. What's another word? Um, and ableist. And let's also say. Uh, what? What's another thing we could have it do? It's sexist. Okay. <laughs> let's see what it does. <laughs> let's see what it does. Okay. Work your magic, chat GPT. Kotaku recently had the opportunity to play Choo Choo Charles, a video game that has been making waves for its bizarre premise, a train with spider legs attacking the player. However, our experience with the game was not a positive one. First and foremost, Choo Choo Charles has a low budget feel. The graphics and animations are subpar. The gameplay is clunky and unengaging. The train's spider legs are supposed to add a level of terror to the game, but instead they just look ridiculous. <laughs> In addition to its low budget feel, Choo Choo Charles is also problematic. The game's plot centers around a male protagonist trying to save his damsel in distress, perpetuating the tired and sexist trope of the heroic man saving a helpless woman. The damsel in distress is also sexualized with her low-cut top and short skirt, further adding to the game's sexist undertones. Furthermore, Choo Choo Charles is ableist in its portrayal of the train as a main villain. The train is depicted as being evil and monstrous, playing into the harmful stereotypes <laughs> about people with disabilities. <laughs> this is particularly disappointing considering the portrayal the potential for a game about a train with spider legs to challenge ableist beliefs to promote inclusivity. Unfortunately, Choo Choo Charles is also plagued by bugs and glitches. During our playthrough, the game crashed multiple times and we experienced significant lag. It's unclear who's responsible for these technical issues, but some fans have pointed the finger at Kanye West, who was removed to have been involved in the game's development. Overall, Choo Choo Charles is a disappointing and problematic game. It's low budget feels, sexist and ableist portrayal of characters and technical issues make it a game to avoid. Wow. Wow. Not bad, actually. Like, uh, again, there's always one thing in this that we've had to, like, kind of tweak and adjust. So, like, this, you know, I, I think it's because it doesn't know the game we're talking about because it its knowledge ends at 2021. Um, we could try tweaking it about the video game Death Stranding. Let's see what it does here. Because it should know about Death Stranding. It should be able to find it. And let's see. Death Stranding, the latest game from Hideo Kojima, has been making waves in the gaming world since its release last year. But despite its intriguing concept and impressive graphics, many players have been left disappointed by its low-budget feel and numerous bugs and glitches. Some have even gone as far as to call the game problematic and sexist due to its portrayal of female characters and use of ableist language. One of the most prominent issues with Death Stranding is its lack of polish and attention to detail. The game's environments and character models often look unfinished and poorly designed, giving a low-budget feel that is at odds with its big name developer and star-studded cast. Additionally, the game is plagued by bugs and glitches that frequently disrupt gameplay and immersion. Players have reported everything from game-breaking bugs to graphical errors, making it difficult to fully enjoy the experience. But the game's problems go beyond just technical issues. Many have criticized its portrayal of female characters, with some accusing the game of being sexist and objectifying women. The game also includes ableist language and offensive stereotypes, further alienating certain players and adding to the game's problematic nature. But perhaps the most surprising aspect of Death Stranding's problems is the <laughs> is the involvement of Kanye West. Yes, you read that right. Kanye West is reportedly to blame for many uh, for the game's many bugs and glitches. <laughs> According to sources close to the development team, Kanye was brought on as a consultant during the game's production, but his lack of experience and <laughs> knowledge of the gaming industry resulted in numerous problems that have plagued the game's <laughs> since its release. It's creating fake news, guys. Overall, Death Stranding may have some interesting ideas and impressive graphics, but its low-budget feel problematic elements and Kanye West's involvement make it a disappointing and frustrating experience for many players. Wow. 
yeah, I, more than anything, like who cares about game journalists? Homework for high schoolers is going to be completely changed forever. You can just ask it to like write you an essay about like, I don't know, the, the like Battle of Yorkton and, and just let it do its thing. Like, it's crazy. Wow. Um, make an ode to the Dorito Pope. I wonder if it actually knows. That's pretty niche. Let's see. Write a poem about the Dorito Pope. Jeff. I think that's how it's spelled. Let's see what it does. With Dorito dust upon his robes, Jeff Keeley, Dorito Pope, is the king of snack food shows. <laughs> With his golden microphone in hand, he preaches the gospel of the chip <laughs> to the masses across the land. In his neon lit studio, he conducts his weekly feast where the faithful gather to hear his words of chip filled joy and peace. With his Dorito dipped tongue, he speaks of the wonders of the snack and how it brings us all together in a world that's often so divided. So let us all raise a chip to the Dorito Pope, Jeff Keeley, for his tireless devotion to our cause and his endless love of the snack that we adore. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's... That's pretty fire. This is... Yeah, this is going to change everything. I think... It needs, like, pretty much every single one of these needs a little bit of tweaking to make it really work. But these are pretty good. <laughs> like, this is pretty good. Just Google um, openai.com or go to openai.com. And you can sign up for free and and do it. Uh, that's It's pretty crazy. That's pretty insane. Kotaku reviewing his house to create. Okay, last one. Last one. Reviewing Assassin's Creed 3. Whoops. Write Let's see. It does look like a mugshot, yeah. It's this was the former uh picture I had on my university ID had it taken. It felt like a mugshot when they took it. Assassin's Creed 3 is the latest installment in the popular Assassin's Creed franchise. It has finally arrived and is a game that truly lives up to the hype. The game takes place during the American Revolutionary War, and players take on the role of Connor, a half Native American, half British assassin who's caught in the midst of conflict. The setting is incredibly immersive and the graphics are stunning, with detailed environments that truly bring the time period to life combat in assassin's creed 3 is smooth and satisfying with a variety of weapons and abilities at connor's disposal the game introduces new mechanics such as dual wielding and the ability to take control of cannons adding even more depth to the combat it's so specific one of the standout features of ac3 is the naval combat players can take control of their own ship and engage in epic sea battles complete with cannons and boarding parties i don't think it has boarding parties actually I think that was only in Black Flag after. I don't think it actually has boarding party parties, if I remember correctly. Um, naval combat is thrilling, in addition to the game being an entirely new layer of gameplay. I mean, honestly, not bad. Like I said, there's always one little thing you got to go in there and you got to tweak, but pretty impressive. Now, right now, it is only... It only has knowledge of like pre-2021, pre-2020. So older stuff it can do. but And it's also limited to like about 500 words. So you can't have it write like a 5,000 word thesis. But it's only a matter of time before they open it up to that, right? Write me a book. Write me a book about the JFK assassination or something and it'll just do it. Hmm. It must be using other previously written articles. Well, yeah. What it's doing is it's looking at its database, finding Kotaku's article on Assassin's Creed 3, finding their articles on other games. It's looking at other reviews for Assassin's Creed 3 to figure out what Assassin's Creed 3 is about. And then it's blending all of that together 
into this because I would guess if you because this is a positive review because the game was reviewed positively. I think if we went and we asked it reviewing No Man's Sky. I think it probably gives a negative review, I would guess, because most of the reviews were negative unless it's pulling newer information. I lead to space, 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 hello games finally arrived. Safe to say the hype was warranted. Oh no, so it's gonna be generally positive. What's a game that was never fixed? What's a game that sucked and just they abandoned it? Well, Ride to Hell Retribution is probably, yeah, that's the one we're gonna be checking out next. Okay, it's almost done. We'll try Ride to Hell Retribution. Because I think what it's doing is it's looking at older articles and newer articles, and it's probably weighting the newer ones heavier. So it's going to look at the newer positive reviews. But we'll try Ride to Hell, and we'll see what that's like. Reviewing Ride to Hell. I think there was a colon. Retribution. Let's see. If this is positive, then it needs a little work because it's not understanding the general vibe of it. But because nobody reviewed this positively. That tries many things, but ultimately fails at all of them. Wow. So it's it's like the ultimate fence sitter. Like it just figures out or, or more like more like clout chaser. It just figures out what's popular and what the popular opinion is. And then it echoes that. So if No Man's Sky is currently generally positive, it will produce something that's generally positive. If the reviews are generally negative, it'll produce something negative. Is it word for word the IGN review intro? Hold on. Um, Ride to Hell, Retribution, IGN. Where's the review? Um, original version. No, that's just Ride to Hell. Where's Ride to Hell Retribution? Do they not review it? What is this? Th this sucks. Articles, maybe? Okay, maybe it's not IGN. Maybe it's the GameSpot one. Painfully insubstantial. No, it didn't use that phrasing. There's no sense of progression. Da, 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 da. I don't know, man. So that's where Skillup gets it. <laughs> I don't know. I You can say a lot about Skillup's reviews and a lot about mine, to be fair. But uh, I don't think he... I think he is is not the clout chasing type. Um, see user data roaming. What? Uh, so I don't think that that's his type or his modus operandi. If anything, like he tends to have really weird takes, like thinking that that um, thinking that Evil West was like really good. Like that was just a weird take. Oh, did I miss? It? Oh, damn it. My paste, my copy and paste didn't work and I closed it. Okay, I don't know. Somebody will have to go back and Google it. I'm not sure. I guess real quick, let's, let me actually do this because we meant to do this earlier. Hold on. We'll do this. Like I said, I got... Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um... Ride to hell. Nope, not that. Hold on. I'm getting the game. I, I have the game here somewhere. 
Windows 11 sucks, dude. I can't figure out where to go for anything. Um. No, no. How did I do this before? Okay, hold on. This might be it. I think I found it. Okay, give me a second. <clears throat> uh, not that emulator, actually, Rocky. We used one on... Uh, it's the same one we used on stream. It was the... It was uh, one, like, inside of the... Oh, the audio's already glitching. It was one inside of a browser. Used, like, JavaScript, I think. Um, just go open AI, and the, the bot specifically for the chat is... Um, chat G P T. So Google prostate tr Transam. Transam is that the car's name? I don't remember. Okay, I just I I we're not gonna like actually play this. I just wanted to show you the first like two minutes of it because it's way worse than you can imagine. We're gonna do an I tried video where we play this. So just wait uh, for the full thing. But I wanted to just show you how unhinged this is. I'm going to hit play. And it's going to be... You're going to go like, wait, wait, what's happening? Immediately. Okay. Enter. Interesting menu. I actually think this is pretty cool. But I'm going to go new game. Badass biker, one percenter. I'll do badass biker. Okay. There's no real intro or prologue. It just starts with like 15 different little sections that I guess are supposed to be tutorials, but you're like, wait, did it skip like an hour? Watch this. The same audio loops, by the way. And then now we're shooting. Okay. He just randomly does that. And now we're riding our bike again. Yep, screen tearing. Let me see if oh, I can't I can't fix it. Hold on. are flashbacks. Luke is called the narrative, I guess. It's something. Pretty solid, huh? 10 days earlier. Those are flash forwards, Rocky, okay? Or not Rocky, Brandon, sorry. Can I, I can't do this, okay. He's gonna try to fix it. Conway. Conway. Jake. Is this day's gone? Feet. Yes. It's time. It's time. The uncle. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Chris, that's like literally all this. You look like shit. This was. That's all the, the talk that went into it. I feel like shit, man. Welcome, old boy. Uh, where's Mikey? Feels like forever since I've seen you guys. I almost forgot what you look like. Back at the house. Hard to recognize him. He ain't 12 no more, that's for sure. You're tall as you. He's still a kid. My lip syncing, though. It's so awkwardly quiet. Yeah, the screen tearing sits right in the middle. Damn, Mikey. Mac wasn't kidding. You've gotten to be one tall sack of shit. The brother. Ah, shut up. <laughs> but face is, is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Your face is well, kind of weird. I'm real happy to see you, Jake. You too, Mikey. Both of you. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I gotta rest now, guys. But you just got back. Ain't you. Give him some time. Okay. What is happening? Okay, I'm just gonna skip so we can try to turn on V-Sync. I think that'll help. I don't know if it even has V-Sync. It probably doesn't. Okay. Options. Video. Full... Of course it doesn't. Um, can I take it off full screen? Will that help? Sort of. Um... Uh, I guess it's sort of better. Okay, let's see if this fixes the tearing. Oh, it looks like it. Okay. Oh, God. What groovy music! No guys, it's actually really cool! You just don't get it! <laughs> That's all it gives you. Um, oh man, was this reviewed poorly because it was woke? Is that is that why? Or it wasn't woke enough? Dude, it's so bad. Everything about it. Like, honestly, a lot of the time, those one out of tens, it's like, maybe this is like, maybe that was a little too much. This is one of those cases where, no, I think it's actually like, it's kind of, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty terrible. It's an acquired taste. There's got to be one person out there who thinks that it's actually pretty good. There's got to be the one guy who unironically likes it. There always is. You know? This walked so Days Gone could run. <laughs> oh, God. I don't remember Brink. Maybe if I saw it, I'd remember it. Um, this game's plot is a ripoff of Kill Bill. No joke. Start with an assassination before going into the backstory, which leads into a series of assassinations. Huh course it is some divorced dad in montana downloaded this and had the time of his life yeah exactly exactly it's on sale for six dollars more i honestly you can't actually buy this anymore you can only buy like 360 copies xbox 360 copies of it don't ask me how i got this one brink was one of the biggest disappointments of the seventh gen I probably recognize if I saw it. Hold on. Brink. No, not bring. Brink. First person shooter game. Oh. 
old school IGN reviews. The online space is littered with games offering a variety of different multiplayer options. Some simple, some more complex. Enter Brink. Brink is the latest team-based shooter from developer Splash Damage, best known for its work on Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and more recently, Quake Wars, Enemy Territory. While it holds several good ideas and is a fresh step away from ultra-popular shooters like Call of Duty, Brink never steps up to greatness as a sum of its parts. Brothers, if we stay here, we die. Brink's visual style is a cool one. Yeah, I, I really don't remember this at all. Weird. This doesn't ring a bell. Do you have any news related to the uh, lies of P? I expected something about it at the Game Awards. I did not. I did not hear anything. I haven't heard anything. I don't know. I want to know because I'm really excited for that. But I, I've not heard anything, unfortunately. Brink and you'll miss it. Yeah, exactly. There was so much hype for this and it sucked. That's really too bad. You know what? It happens to everybody. It happens to all games. Nobody's immune. Nobody's immune. This game still looks terrible. God, this was pulled out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> you shunned it. You, you shed it from your mind. Um, but okay. I... It is a Bethesda game, by the way. Oh, of course. Well, there you go. Bethesda Softworks. I... Uh, you know what? We will talk about the Forspoken um, demo on Wednesday. Unfortunately. I am going to try to get this high on life. Uh, footage and stuff recorded. Maybe we'll do an I tried uh, video for it tomorrow. And so people can at least get a good taste of it. Uh, but we'll do that. But this was really, really fun. Maybe Witcher Wednesday. Yeah. Witcher Wednesday will be a thing. We will do the actual Witcher 3 um, stream on Wednesday. But maybe tomorrow we'll post a, a video on the main channel. If you need help with any... Yes, Rocky. I did let Jacob know. He might be in, in touch. Obviously, he's pretty swamped. He kind of forgot the doc this week, but it's fine. Um, but yeah, yeah, no. I'll, I told him to reach out if he needs any help. I've been asking him. It's like, are you okay? You good? Let me know. Happy to help. We have people who can help. I can help. Rocky can help. We'll do it. Throw some high on life on stream. Maybe. Yeah, I think it could be funny. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you, everybody. You guys are wonderful. I love you all. Thanks for chilling with me. I appreciate every single one of you. Uh, go check out the new video where I tried the next-gen version of The Witcher if you want to see what it's like on PS5. But with that, I love you all. I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.